Welcome to the party, pal. You're from the neighborhood master chaos. Back with you once again for another amazing interview. I am I am so honored and thrilled to be having the the man, the myth, the legend, the genre expert, Mr. Troy Howarth here with us uh, tonight. Troy, how are you, sir? <laughs> I'm good. I don't know if I can live up to that, but I'm good. <laughs> Uh, well, we're we're big fans here uh, at Master Chaos TV. We we always love your commentaries, and uh, and I was uh, I was uh, frankly very uh, very thrilled when I reached out to you on Facebook and and you said yeah I'll come on and and talk movies I'm like oh my god this is amazing uh, uh, movie nerd come true uh, dream come true for me. Well, thank you. You're very kind. Happy to be here. Excellent. Uh, before we uh, before we jump into the topic, we are talking top twenty giallos. Uh, according to Troy, um, I I ran out of JMB, but you got to have some kind of whiskey. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna pour a little agitator here, and because uh, uh, we're gonna be talking about agitators in a way, we're gonna be talking about uh, cinematic uh, agitators, uh, which is a really fun way to describe directors who push the envelope. Um, let's check in with the chat real quick. Uh, Eric, how you doing, man? This is a big time topic. It is, and we're gonna we're gonna dive deep, deep, deep into it. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Just Dave is here. Hello, my friend. Uh, Mike says this is great. We're only getting started, pal. So uh, hold on tight. And uh, Jim, we're talking uh, giallos tonight. I hope you'll join us uh, for the uh, for the, this in, a, a insightful and exciting conversation. It's gonna be a bloody one. And Bumpy, Howarth and Thompson are the Crockett and Tubbs of commentaries. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's true. Yeah. And Nathaniel's going to be on in a couple weeks, too. So, um, uh, oh, that's, good. yeah, that's going to be fun. Uh, Zach, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Eternal, welcome to you. And Timothy, good to see you. Okay, everybody in the chat, if you have questions for Troy, go ahead and, and drop them. I, when, when we have a... When we have a moment, I will, you know, address that. We we have we have Troy for about ninety minutes to two hours, depending on um, how it all shakes out. He's put together a list of his top twenty uh, favorite uh, Giallo films, which probably was not easy. Before we get into that, Troy, tell us tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to discover Giallos. Well, I guess I discovered them long before I actually knew what they were. Um, I was a uh, child of the 80s, so growing up, um, I saw a lot of the late night horror movies uh, that would run on Friday nights, Saturday nights, especially like on Channel 9, WOR. And they they ran some European movies every now and again. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm young enough at this point, I don't even have any concept of what Europe is, <laughs> what other countries, I'm just a kid. Uh, but you could tell from watching some of these movies that they were a little weird, they were a little different, they sounded different. Um, mm -hmm. The lip movements didn't always match, and that was something that took me a while to kind of get used to, um, which is something I have to learn to be more tolerant of with, with other people when they struggle with it, because I tend to forget sometimes it took me a long time to get used to that. Um, but uh, one of the ones that I saw as a kid was a movie called The Night Evelyn Came Out of the Grave, which, uh, funnily enough, became the very first movie I ever did, uh, was asked to do an audio commentary for, for Arrow. Um, so at that time, seeing it, it was obviously panned and scanned, uh, a foreign concept now, happily, because that doesn't happen anymore. But back in those days on TV, they take widescreen films and literally have to almost kind of cut them in half in order to fill up the TV screen and, you know, a telecine operator would move it back and forth to show what they wanted to show. It was kind of redirecting the film, as, as Scorsese has said. Mm -hmm. um, but cut it up, you know, to remove any kind of nudity, any kind of violence and everything else. And a movie that already was a little bit shaky in its plot made no sense whatsoever. So I can't say I, I loved it <clears throat> or anything like that, but it's it stuck in my mind. And, you know, gradually just over time started to see some of those films every now and again. I saw Argento's Creepers, the American version of Phenomena, uh, also severely cut to a point that, again, a movie that has its narrative hiccups uh, made even less sense in that version. And uh, kind of just started to gradually get an idea of what these films were all about. Uh, the directors, the major players like Bava, Argento, Fulci. Um, and then gradually as time went on, started to get really hardcore into them really obsessive about them 
Uh, yeah, I, I know you're a big Bava guy, and I, I, I agree. Uh, Mario Bava, I, I think, is is one of the great filmmakers of all time. I, I think he was actually my first, now that I think back, he probably was the first kind of giallo thing I watched, and then that sort of led down the road to Dario and, and, and Fulci and things like that. Um, but thanks pretty much to Anchor Bay, who, you know, Anchor Bay was sort of putting out all that good stuff back then. And so that that was my gateway drug. Um and uh, how how does somebody who, like for yourself, how did you go about trying to study these movies? Because like you know, it, there wasn't a lot of information about these movies available at the time. No, um, I started to take a real serious interest around 1995 when I graduated from high school. Um, I had taken a year off before going on to college, and just coincidentally during that period of time. Um, I don't even know why I, I wanted to try and get a hold of a better copy of Baba's film, Baron Blood, um, which had been the first European horror film I ever saw. I saw it when I was very, very young and, uh, I, I had a copy, but it was a really ragged, ratty looking copy. It was cut from TV. So I wanted to, I knew that HBO had put out a cassette of it back in the day. So I tried to get a hold of a copy and by this point it's out of print. So I couldn't get it. By an amazing coincidence, within a couple of weeks or so, I remember picking up Fangoria and reading that they were putting out a laser disc of Baron Blood and Lisa and the Devil, you know, the uncut uh, director's uh, cuts on laser disc. And uh, of course, I had to have that. So that kind of triggered this tremendous just onslaught of European cult cinema during that year that I was off. I, I was working a lot. Um, most of my friends had, had scattered to the four winds. They'd gone to school. Uh, so I didn't have much to do except buy movies. And I was buying a lot of uh, bootlegs through gray market uh, companies like Midnight Video and Video Search in Miami, places like that. And started by getting all the Bava films that I could. And then Zargento and Fulci and Franco and just kind of. And at that time, I had no clue that these movies were well liked. Uh, I had no clue that anybody cared about them. I had read very, very little about them apart from a wonderful book that was kind of my big um, Bible that made me want to write about movies, a book called The Encyclopedia of Horror Films, written or, or edited rather by Phil Hardy. Um, mm -hmm. They had a lot of movies uh, of this type reviewed in there, not always enthusiastically, but they were, they were in there. <clears throat> so that, uh, that, that kind of, gave me a little bit of an insight into who some of these people were. Although uh, Hardy and his writers weren't always very fair to some of these directors, like Franco in particular, they were really harsh on Franco, I think, uh, mm. fairly so. But yeah, you're, you get used to that when you're a Franco fan. You're used to kind of defending him against people, you know, constantly attacking him all the time. Um, but I, you know, got a sense of who, you know, Bava and Argento, Fulci, um, and then <clears throat> digging a little bit deeper, Freda, Lenzi, um, Dalamano and some of the others mm -hmm. and I mean I, there was no at, at the time I wasn't online <clears throat> I wasn't on the internet so um, I didn't have access to a lot of the different things that we take very much for granted now as far as just being able to type something into Google and there it is uh, you can type in a director's name and get their entire body of work when I I started writing what was initially meant to be a uh, kind of a either a very lengthy article or maybe a monograph on Mario Bava and I didn't even realize the full extent of what he had directed I, I there were films I had never heard of I, I hadn't read a great deal about him at the time I'd read uh, that Tim Lucas had an article in uh, Fangoria back in the 80s I think it was which I had read um, but there were certain films that I think even he had missed at that time because again you know we're, it's very difficult to find out much about these films so I didn't know about all of them. And uh, it was interesting when I finally started going to college, I started taking a, a, a film, uh, sort of film theory class. And I decided to show my professor what I had written. And he told me, you know, you've got a book here. I thought he was crazy because I never in a million years thought that I could write a book. But he said, no, you've got the start of a book here. You're going to have to expand it. You're going to have to work on it and everything. So I did. Um, so I literally sort of wrote that book the whole way through college, uh, which became The Haunted World of Mario Bava, which was not a title that I wanted. 
Um, I actually wanted to call it Blood and Black Humor. I don't know if that's any good or not, but that's what I wanted to call it at the time. But the British publisher said, no, the humor, the spelling with the U uh, for the British people would confuse the Americans. <laughs> so I don't know. The Hundred World Mark Baba was kind of imposed on me. And I had no idea at the time that uh, the Tim Lucas was actually working, had been working on a book. Had I known that, I probably wouldn't have done it. So I'm glad I didn't know, <laughs> quite frankly, <laughs> because um, there should be multiple perspectives out there on these people. Nobody should have kind of the, um, you know, the monopoly on it. So I, I hope other people will continue to write about all of these people that I've written about and, and this genre as well, you know, uh, build on what's there and, and hopefully, you know, get deeper and sometimes better and uh, come up with, you know, different slants and different interpretations and so on. But it was very difficult in the beginning, you know, trying to track down a lot of these films. But as time has gone on, um, fortunately, we're at a place now where most of this stuff, even if it's not officially available through uh, a nice DVD or preferably Blu-ray release, um, there is the gray market and there's these wonderful people uh, who do fan subtitles on movies. And so a lot of the movies that haven't been released in English have been subtitled. It may be a little ropey at times, but, it, you know, it's at least it's a way you can see it. It's right. a way you can kind of understand it. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's comparatively easy now. Everything's kind of at your fingertips, whereas back in my day, as they say, <laughs> it was – it was a little trickier and certainly a lot trickier for people who came before me who obviously didn't have any of the advantages that I had, you know, even later on. So uh, it's kind of an exciting time to be alive if you're into these, into these movies. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, uh, well, I think what I like about these films the most is they feel timeless. I mean, there, there are elements that date them, but they do feel timeless. And I feel that that adds to the rediscovery uh, factor. So people will always find these movies like oh horror fed will eventually get to the italian stuff uh and so i love that that it gives them a life beyond uh, beyond what the filmmakers even thought uh was possible uh, there's a question from asian movie enthusiasts which i don't know if you can answer what started the jb jmb references in giallo films <laughs> it's not just giallo films it's it's very pr uh, prominent in uh, the poliziotesky films too and of course mm -hmm. there's a lot of crossover between those films you get movies like um uh well there's, there's a really good one with stuart whitman called blazing magnums which is a good poliziotesco title but then it's also known as strange shadows in an empty room which is a good giallo title so it's kind of one of each um, it, um, no doubt it was just uh, promotional kickbacks, you know, it's the typical thing. If you put our product in your film, you know, we'll, we'll give you some financial perks and it's not just J and B, uh, you know, certainly also things like Marlboro, Marlboro cigarettes, mm. um, in the seventies in particular, everybody smoked. So it's, it's a uh, very, very, um, blunt in these films in a way that you wouldn't see now. I mean, certainly with regards to tobacco in particular, you wouldn't see it in films now. But j &B is kind of the signature drink of European cult cinema in general. I mean, it's not as prominent, obviously. I mean, you, you, you don't really have it in the um, the gothic horror films for obvious reasons. It, it would, wouldn't fit. Um, but the Jally, it's it's in a ton of them, and it's, it's remarkably blatant in certain films. Um, I've often thought that I should at some point just sit down and try to go through these films again and uh, pick out the uh, the J and B sightings and some of the other products uh, sightings. Um, but uh, you know, it's it's one of those things that if you watch enough of these movies, you kind of get a kick out of it. I think. Yeah, I, absolutely. Uh, yeah, every time I every time I see it, I'm like, oh man, I'm I'm, I'm I gotta I gotta have some new. Uh, Jim asks a really good question uh, that sort of leads into our list. Jim says, what makes a Giallo film really stand out? Well, I mean, I guess it's the same for any film, really. I mean, it's it's ultimately it's the overall consistency of vision and quality. And, uh, you know, is it doing something that's interesting? And is it doing something that, you know, if it's setting out to achieve certain goals, is it achieving it in a interesting and artistic and uh, accomplished sort of way? So the best Jallo films are, they're remarkably stylish. They're remarkably um, distinctive in terms of 
the use of camera, the use of color, the use of editing, the use of music in particular. Um, music, I think, is one of the great features of these films. I can't think of a good Jalo with a bad soundtrack, but I can think of many bad Jalo with great soundtracks. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's always essential. I mean, it it, it but they. The, part of the difficulty and part of what makes this a difficult genre to define in some ways, and one of the reasons it's kind of controversial when you get into the topic of what is a giallo versus what isn't, um, is there there is a sort of subjective quality to that sometimes that some people will look at certain films and say, well, that's a giallo, and I would say, no, I don't think it is. Um, mm -hmm. That's not to say that it, it most definitively isn't. It's just, in my opinion, it's not. Um, some of them uh, take a slightly more, dare I say, artistic kind of an approach, whereas others are more kind of grubby exploitation type films. And mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with the grubby exploitation stuff if they are successful at doing what they set out to do. Uh, some of the films are incredibly blatant about what they're all about. I mean, strip nude for your killer. You know what you're going to get out of that film. And it more or less delivers. I mean, it's not one of my favorites, but it you know you're you're looking to watch uh, a particular type of film when you get a movie like that off the shelf and it delivers so um yeah i, I think the best of them manage to be you know uh, as with any other type of genre they need to be engaging they need to be interesting they need to hold your attention the whole way through not just during the murder set pieces but during the whole fabric of the film so that's where some of them fall down they would have really good really interesting individual set pieces but then when it gets bogged down in the plot, it gets boring, you know, you're spending too much time with the police and you're, you know, things that are kind of drab and uninteresting. And so your attention flags. So the best of them don't suffer from that. I think the best of them are incredibly engaging and incredibly um, entertaining the whole way through. Uh, yeah, I, I, I concur with that. I mean, that, the worst a movie could be is boring. <laughs> And uh, and I've I've run into a handful of jolly that just put me to sleep. So uh, absolutely, they have to be entertaining. Yeah. Um, Marco has a good question. You mentioned music. He says, uh, "What's your most memorable giallo theme?" He's going with Profundo Rosso from Goblins. Yeah, Profundo Rosso, definitely Goblin. I think that's probably my favorite soundtrack of of any of them. Um, that was, I mean, it's an interesting story in the sense that it didn't start out to be Goblin. It was originally going to be a, a jazz musician that Argento had worked with called uh, Giorgio Gaslini. Uh, Gaslini had done the music for his uh, Door to Darkness TV series and also his ill-fated sort of historical comedy drama, The Five Days, um, which was an attempt to kind of get away from doing Jally and, and do something a little different. Nobody mm. cared for it. So he came right back and did Deep Red. And initially he had uh, Gaslini on board. He claimed that he also tried to get um, Pink Floyd. Um, I mean, I don't know. Maybe he did. Maybe he tried. I don't know that anybody would really believe that that was possible to get them. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, the, the Goblin at that time had been known as Cherry Five. Um, they were a, a kind of a young group of musicians and Argento. Uh, I think Risley said, you know, you need to come up with a better name. It's not going to look very good. You know, Deep Red scored by Cherry Five. It doesn't sound very good. So Goblin became the name. Um, they didn't do all the music in the film. Some of the music is by Gaslini. But, of course, they did the, the most memorable themes. And that includes the Profondo Rosso theme. But I also really love their Death Dies theme, which plays over all of the uh, murder sequences in that film. There's so many others I can point to. I mean, my goodness, uh, the, the main theme, uh, Una Lucha Tola, for Liz Under Woman's Skin, Ennio Morricone's music for a uh, Lucha Fulci film, uh, is beautiful, uh, a relatively minor giallo film called uh, Forbidden Photos of a Lady Above Suspicion has some incredible Morricone music. And really one of Morricone's great scores is for a, a little known giallo, um, it's almost in a way more of a borderline giallo because it's not, it's, it is and it isn't. It's, it's, it's an odd film. It's a movie called Dirty Angels from 1969. Um, what an amazing score that has. Um, I'm rambling, I know. So <laughs> I'll just tell you, <laughs> Perfume de Rosso is, has to be for me the, uh, the top uh, giallo score. Love it. Okay, very good. Um, there's a lot of questions here. I want to get to everything, guys, but I want to start the list. So what we're going to do is we'll do five movies on this, about the top 20, so we'll do five, and then we'll 
we'll head to your questions. Here we go. All right, uh, Troy, why don't you uh, kick us off with the, the first film you wanna you wanna highlight? Well, do you start towards the top or start towards the bottom? Um, it's up to you, man. Whatever, whatever you feel. Uh, I think would whatever flow the best. I mean, if there's no particular order, where you know, whatever you, wherever you want to go. We'll start with Deep Red. I, mean, I don't okay. think it's any great that that's my favorite of all Jally. I've described it as the Jallo to end all Jally. Um, I think it's it's by far Argento's greatest film. I know that's uh, controversial because some people will will you know, live and die by Suspiria. And of course, Suspiria is a great film. Um, Suspiria is not a giallo. Uh, some people yeah. insist that it is because it's got black gloves in it and, and people die, but no, it's not. It's a supernatural horror film. Mm -hmm. um, but Deep Red is definitely, you know, it's it's the Rolls Royce of uh, Gialli. And it features uh, a great central performance by David Hemmings, who um, I think is really terrific in the film. And he, his casting kind of recalls, of course, his iconic role as the photographer for Antonioni in Blow Up, mm. which was the big, big film that made him into a huge star for a period of time in the 60s and 70s. Um, interestingly, he was not originally going to play the lead. It was going to be an Italian actor named uh, Lino Capolicchio who had, uh, would go on to play the lead in an interesting Argento kind of homage uh, movie called Bloodstained Shadow. Mm. Um, but uh, he, you know, I think they ultimately decided that they needed a, a name that was better for the international marketplace, so they get David Hemmings. And pairing him up with Dario Nicolodi, this is her first film with Dario Argento, of course. A, a collaboration that's incredibly important, a very explosive and unstable relationship, um, but it was at its happiest. It was really, a, a, the only period it was really, really happy was that period when they were together uh, from 1974, making Deep Red through the writing of Suspiria, at least the early part of the writing of Suspiria before mm -hmm. things started to fall apart. So Deep Red is incredibly ambitious. Um, it was not a huge budget film, but Argeno had the advantage of a nice long schedule. And that enabled him to get all kinds of really interesting camera angles, all kinds of coverage, and to make really his ultimate statement on this particular type of film he was very well known for. Um, and bringing in the progressive rock sound of Goblin to score the film, very different from the early films he did, which were scored by Morricone, mm -hmm. really kind of established him as the master of this type of film. And... Uh, you know, he was and remains really a celebrity in his own right in Italy. He's uh, kind of, it's its a level of fame and a level of popularity that you don't tend to get in America, for example. I mean, most people in America don't really care about who directors are. They care more about movie stars. Mm -hmm. But Argento was almost a, a star in his own right. And uh, Deep Red was definitely one of the films that helped to cement that. Of course, followed by Suspiria in 1977, which was even more successful. Um, but it's it's a remarkable film. I mean, I, I think the plot works very well. Uh, he wrote it in collaboration with Bernardino Saponi, who was a terrific screenwriter who'd worked a lot with Fellini and, and various other uh, great auteur-type directors. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a tightly plotted film. It's very well paced, beautifully shot, uh, fantastic score, great cast. I mean, what else could you want? Yeah, no, it's it, it's a phenomenal movie. I mean, I think that's that that's the movie that most people start with when they they kind of want to get into this or or into, uh, I mean, into into Dario at all. That's kind of the one that they most people start with. That one or Suspiria, but uh, Deep Red, absolutely, I agree. That that is a, a masterpiece film. Uh, what's uh, number two? Well, the the first uh, few are roughly in order. After that, they kind of. You know, they're all over the place. But <laughs> my number two is indeed my number two. And that's uh, Lucio Fulci's Don't Torture a Duckling from 1972. Uh, 1972, 73, those were the big years for Jallo films. That's when the market was really getting glutted with lots and lots of Jallo films. And Argento, of course, was very annoyed by this because, of course, he makes films, uh, his first three films all have um, – you know, kind of a, a running theme in the title. They're, they're known as the Animal Trilogy. So all of a sudden, all these other Italian filmmakers are making movies with kind of similar Baroque titles. Mm -hmm. So you have things like Don't Torture a Duckling, Lizard and Roman Skin, uh, Black Belly of the Tarantula, 
you know, the Iguana with a Tongue of Fire. That's probably the all-time great Gonzo ridiculous title out of that batch. Uh, Bloodstained Butterfly, you know, you name it. All, all kinds of different uh, titles with uh, creepy crawlies and animals and whatnot in the titles. Uh, Don't Torture a Duckling is one of the relatively few uh, kind of regional jelly. A lot of Jalo films either try to sort of pawn themselves off as either faux American or faux British films, um, sometimes even faux Canadian, believe it or not. Um, you know, it's usually the reverse. It's usually Canadian films are trying to pass themselves off to be American, but, you know, Italians, they have their, they have their wacky ways. And uh, if they're set in Italy, they're usually set in the familiar sort of tourist areas, you know, places like Rome, of course. You get all the usual kind of landmarks there. Deep Red, of course, was set in Turin, so you get a lot of the, the great landscape there. But Fulci makes this film, and he sets it in a small backwards community um, in, a, in a very rural area. And that's one of the relatively few films that does that, uh, along with another film that's on the list we'll come to shortly. Um, it's a angry film. It's a powerful film. It's uh, The big difference, I think, between Argento and Fulci isn't really so much of talent. I think they're basically neck and neck. Uh, Argeno had certain advantages, um, not, not least was the fact, of course, his, his father was a successful producer, which enabled him to kind of get into directing a little bit easier than, than it had been for Fulci, for example. And that was something that Fulci and other men of his generation had a little bit of an issue with. I think they were a little bit jealous. Um, but that's no slight against Argeno. I mean, he has the talent to back it up. Uh, but uh, Fulci, I think, you know, in terms of talent, was basically on the same tier. Um, an incredibly diverse filmmaker. I mean, I love the eclecticism of Fulci's filmography. He did a little bit of everything. He made, uh, he made Iran, he made horror, he made uh, fiction, uh, you know, he made costume films. He did a little bit of everything. And crucially, he did very well. Um, some directors, directors maybe would dabble in, in different genres, but maybe weren't quite as good at some or at others. I mean, Baba's my favorite, okay? uh, but Baba was not well suited. His westerns are not very good. Fulci's westerns are great. Um, mm. But I think the big thing Argento and Fulci is that Argento's approach tends to be rather cool and aesthetic, whereas uh, Fulci's is very fiery and passionate and angry. And uh, that comes through, I think, very powerfully in Don't Torture a Duckling, especially in the uh, signature sequence in the film, which is something that he echoed later on in his movie, The Beyond, uh, a sequence where a, uh, a, a, a so-called witch is uh, fallen under suspicion of being the murderer mm. responsible for the killings of these children in this small village. And the, uh, the villagers gang up on her, and it's a horrific sequence of, of violence that's enacted. Um, an incredibly brutal, powerful sequence, but it's also very melancholy and very sad. And uh, I've seen the film so many times, but every time I see it, I mean, it, it, it chokes me up a little bit every time I see that sequence. And it also makes you wince because he knew how to sell things like that. He knew how to make that really work. Um, the, the, the violent scenes and so forth in his movies, they have, they're really quite nasty. <laughs> and, uh, Sometimes I agree that we get him into trouble, as we'll talk about a movie that's coming up shortly. Um, but Don't Torture is another one. It's a really good, solid, well put together plot. It's very engaging the whole way through. It's got a really good cast, uh, headed by Tomas Millian, who, uh, you know, if you're into these movies, you know who Tomas Millian is, but in the uh, sort of mainstream American audience, although he did things like Traffic and Onstad and so forth, um, he's not a particularly well known actor, but he was a big actor in Italy during this time, especially thanks to Spaghetti Westerns and Lizio Um, He very often did weird performances. He became very well known for playing uh, Nico Giraldi in a series of Lizio Teschi and also the character of Manetza, uh, Garbage Man, in, uh, in, in a series of kind of comic Lizio Teschi. He's got sort of a frizzy wig on and on and, and stubble. He dresses ridiculously and he's this kind of figure of fun. Uh, he's very normal <laughs> in Don't Torture a Duckling. He's not playing a kind of quirky thing at all. He's playing a, a reporter uh, who is uh, kind of cynically at first investigating these crimes, but, uh, you know, his his emotions kind of get deeper as it goes along. Mm -hmm. um, it's a great film. I mean, again, a you know, broken record, but, I you know, all of these first ones, I think, are legitimately great films. But I think Don't Torture a Duckling is the best film that Fulci ever made. 
Yeah, I, I really enjoy that movie. Is that the one with Barbara Boucher? Barbara Boucher, and she has the uh, famous sequence, of course, where the little boy comes into the room to serve her orange aid, and she's naked. Yeah. Um, and that was accomplished, so we should note, with uh, the use of a little person when they were shooting behind. It was an adult little person uh, instead of a child. Um, so no, no laws were broken in the filming of this sequence. Um, yeah, she's very good. And Florinda Balkan uh, is in it too. She plays the witch um, that I alluded to before. And uh, Greek actress Irene Pappas, who of course had been in Z and uh, Zorba the Greek and so forth. Uh, she's in it as well. And Marco Perel, who's another guy that's well known for his Poliziotesky, he plays the the village priest. It's a great, it's just, it's a wonderful film. And uh, it was the film that, uh, that film and Beatrice Cenci, which is another film that starred Tomas Milian, were the two films full she was the proudest of. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. That's cool. Yeah, I, that Barbara Boucher sequence is, is uh, amazing. She's a beautiful woman. And I've always been a uh, Tomas Milian fan. He, he's a fellow Cuban. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we I, kindred spirits for sure uh, uh, with him. So what, uh, what would be number three? Number three is the seminal body count Jallo, and that's Mario Bava's Blood and Black Lace from 1964. Cameron Mitchell and Ava Bartok. Um, still, I think, one of the most visually beautiful films I've ever seen. Um, essential to see this movie in a good transfer. The first time I ever saw it was through the old media cassette back mm. in the, um, I don't know if I saw it in the late 80s or early 90s, but it didn't impress me then because it was very sort of smeary, the colors were faded and the movie just doesn't work when you see it that way. This movie's all about color. This movie's all about aesthetics. It's very much a sort of sly commentary on the way that uh, the fashion industry works, the mm -hmm. way it exploits the, uh, the women who work in fashion. And uh, you know, this, this kind of relationship between the male gaze and, and what's going on in terms of this brutal series of murders, which has an interesting double twist at the end. I don't want to give away for the benefit of the, you know, one person in the room who maybe hasn't seen this film. Um, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's another one. It, and I, it's been criticized by some people and I can understand why uh, Maitland McDonough and her book about Argento, um, she basically says it's, it's a series of great set pieces with dull connecting tissue because of all the scenes with the police. Again, if you see it in a good transfer though, I don't think it works like that. I think it is, quite engaging the whole way through it's beautifully shot and very well paced and i think it's a very tightly plotted movie too it actually unlike some gialli it actually does kind of it, it holds up to scrutiny let's say it yeah. doesn't get to a place where you're like oh come on that's complete bullshit <laughs> no it actually does work um and uh you know it's it's part of that great period of mario bava's career in the 60s where he was just firing on all cylinders with all of his best collaborators with him. He had no money on this film whatsoever. Cameron Mitchell talked about how all these wonderful traveling shots you see in the film, uh, Bava used a little boy's wagon, one of those little red wagons, um, and would sit in, in, the, uh, in the wagon with the camera and get all these wonderful gliding camera shots that you see the whole way through the film. Uh, he, did not have, um, he did not have a dolly. And he said too, for craning shots, um, they would you know just engineer sort of pulley crude pulley things to get the camera to crane because they didn't have a crane so wow it's a because i mean a little bit of uh wi-fi issues you're breaking up a little bit uh sorry uh re repeat all that we lost you a little bit excuse me um uh, right after the uh the pulley the pulley situation okay. i was just saying that more than any of the others it was essentially kind of his uh, one-man film crew because he could do pretty much everything and why even though he had no money to make movies they always looked incredibly lavish incredibly beautiful yeah no it's great uh that that, that is another really uh, really really solid film uh highly recommend that one as well guys um, number four, what would your number four be? That's uh, another Argento. That would be Tenebrae, 1982, um, which was originally released in the U.S. in a cut version called Unsane. Um, cut, cut the movie down a little bit, and they also added a, a Kim Wilde song over the end titles as opposed to the uh, 
it's essentially Goblin. It did the music. They just didn't have the drummer, so they couldn't build it as Goblin. So it's a drum machine plus Simonetti, Pignatelli, and uh, Moranti. But you know, other than that, it's, it's essentially a Goblin score. Um, it's kind of Argento's Brian De Palma movie in many respects. And uh, the reason I say that is a lot of people like to suggest that De Palma steals a lot from Argento. And um, I don't really think that's true. It, the, the topic has been broached to De Palma, and De Palma said in an interview one time that he remembered Scorsese showing him a couple of Bava and Argento films um, back in the 70s. And he said, frankly, they really weren't his cup of tea, and he didn't really remember them very well. He knew he had seen Bird of the Crystal Plumage, but he couldn't remember anything else. Um, so, I, I, you know, he's always been pretty honest about his influences and so forth. So I think it's more likely that in the case of Tenebrae, this is almost like Argeno's kind of take on something like Dress to Kill. It has that similar kind of real sleek, modern quality to it. It's very bright. Um, it's very... Uh, deliberately, I mean, ironically, the title means darkness, the Italian title, Tenebrae, means darkness. But this is a movie that unfolds in bright sunlight, um, and even the night scenes are deliberately overlit. Um, that was very deliberate. So it has a, a very kind of sleek, modern kind of quality to it. It's very much, it's almost like a, a fashion shoot. The whole film is very, very self-consciously stylized in many ways. The the, the men and the women are all very, you know, very well dressed and very well put together. And it's uh, it's it's a very fashionista kind of a giallo in many respects. And of course, it has some of the great Argeno set pieces, um, mm. you know, without wanting to ruin the ending. But the great crane shot that is there for pretty much no reason. Uh, it has no logical reason to be there. <laughs> in the film. We just kind of stopped dead for a, a couple of minutes while the camera, a luma crane, which had been used before. Uh, Roman Polanski used it on uh, the tenant uh, for the opening of the film, and Luciano Tovoli, the cinematographer on the film, had used it for Antonioni on the uh, on the passenger. Um, but it was this wonderful new crane, which enabled them to literally go from one side of the house, crane over the roof, and come around on the other side. Well, it makes no sense when you think about it. I mean, it's not the killer's point of view. Surely he's not climbing over the roof to get to, to, get to the other side. Um, but it's Argento, and that's exactly what he does. And he can get away with that because he knows how to incorporate these great set pieces. Um, it's almost like a little music video inserted into the film. It's a great mm. opportunity to let that goblin music pulse away on the soundtrack while we just do whatever <laughs> as the camera cranes around. Uh, a great, great moment. And, of course, the uh, the great sequence, too, where the, um, where the woman has her arm uh, chopped off with an axe. And uh, like expressionistic uh, modern art, the blood sprays all over this clean white wall. Uh, a great kind of commentary also on the relationship between the artist and the art and its uh, kind of relationship with society and toying around with that idea of, you know, can art be dangerous? And, and I think Argento works that in a very interesting and ironic way throughout. So very clever. It doesn't entirely hold up when you think about it too hard. You know, there are things about it that don't really make a lot of sense, but that's okay because when you're immersed in that world, it, it works completely. Yeah, I, I would I would agree. I think this is I, I mean I go back and forth, but I I, I think Tenebra is probably my favorite uh, Dario Argento uh, film. I, I I just there's something about it that feels very American. Like it doesn't really play like a typical it doesn't have like like when we talk a little bit about the kind of the dreamy shots and the kind of like the weird tangents some of these stories take, you know, beyond that, and I agree that crane shot looks great, but like I'm looking at roof tiles for half of it and that doesn't really add anything to the story. Um, uh, there's, there's just something about Tenebre, you know, it, it's lean and mean, it's muscular, it's bloody and, and the ending packs a wallop. So I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of that movie. Yeah. Um, what would be your number five? Well, it was the other great Jalo of 1982. It was the kind of, I don't know. Jally are still made. I mean, unlike the Spaghetti Western and the Polizio Tesco, it didn't kind of stop. They continued to make them. But 82 was kind of like the last great year. And there was a great double punch of Tenebrae and the New York Ripper, which is Lucio Fulci's most notorious film. Um, and an interesting example of how the Giallo, you know, which itself had sort of evolved out of traditional kind of classical mysteries the creamy films of the Germany, the Edgar Wallace thrillers of the 60s, and then gradually the Jallo informed what became the slasher film. So 
the New York Ripper is a Jello, but it's also definitely a slasher movie as well. And what a slasher movie it is! Um, it has lost none of its impact. Um, it's one of those movies that um, really snobby people love to try to have their cake and eat it too about because they'll say, oh, the movie's so disgusting, but the special effects are so bad. Well, wait a minute. You can't have it both ways. Either the special effects are bad, in which case they're just laughable and it's not disgusting, or, you know, it, you can't have both. No, the movie is not amateurish at all. It's extremely well made. Again, another movie that uh, when I first saw it, um, I can't remember the label. It might have been Vidmark uh, that put it out on VHS in the U.S., Mm. Uh, put out this awful full frame version that was very brown and it was also cut. Um, so it was not looking its best. And um, then to see it in widescreen and, and especially now that Blue Underground has gone and, and upped it, you know, to uh, not only just a, a great new Blu-ray special edition, but also a 4K UHD, uh, you can really appreciate the detail and the texture of that movie now. Um, that was kind of, the end of that great period of activity that Fulci had in the early eighties where he was just making one gem after another. Um, after that, things got a little bit ropier, although there was still great stuff that came afterwards, but the New York Ripper is an angry, nasty film often called misogynistic. And I understand why, but I would say it's not really misogynistic is misanthropic. Um, but what's interesting is that for a film that is as nasty as it is, I think the two, characters that come off relatively sympathetically in the film are the character of the psychiatrist who turns out to be gay. And there's a, uh, a woman, um, a character who's kind of a nymphomaniac kind of a character played by uh, Alexander Delacoli, who is uh, also, I think, depicted rather sympathetically. So it's not as if the film is suggesting that these women deserve what's happening to them, although it is definitely, it almost plays to me like Fulci is responding to the extreme popularity that his gore movies were having at that time. Like, okay, you like gory movies? Well, how about this? And this is really taking it to a level that's realistic, that's nasty, things like this can and do happen. Uh, so it puts on a very different plane as opposed to something like uh, City of the Living Dead or The Beyond, for example. So it's lost none of its impact, and it's one of my great favorites. Yeah, I know. That's that's a, a, a masterpiece of a film. All right, let's take a pause here from the list and answer some questions. Uh, my buddy, Undead Nightmare 24 says, can you consider a murder mystery film other than Italian a giallo? So I guess anything outside of Italy. That's the uh, $50,000 question that keeps coming up a lot because, of course, there are films um, from other countries that are very much like Gialli. I think the term only has real meaning if we're, if we're consistent with it, and it is an Italian term. It's, an, it's a specifically Italian thing in the same way that you wouldn't call a, uh, a Western from uh, you know, America, a spaghetti Western. I mean, it's not really a spaghetti Western unless it's an Italian film. Um, so I'd say that there are definitely, and this is the whole reason for the third volume of So Deadly, So Perverse, which deals with the films from other countries, including the U.S. There's movies even from Greece and India and Turkey and various other countries as well that are very much indebted to the Jallo. And I think we can call them kind of Jallo adjacent or, you know, Jallo style films, but they're not real Jally. And the, the tricky part in this, of course, is the fact that very few of these Italian films are purely Italian. Very often they have financing from other countries. Mm. So you'll have German financing, you'll have Spanish financing, French financing, but the ones that I think are real Jally are the ones that are predominantly Italian made by Italian directors um, with predominantly Italian financing. I mean, Dario Geno made a film in America uh, called Trauma that is a giallo, um, but of course it's an Argeno film and it was also an Italian finance film, even though it was shot in America. So um, it gets a little tricky, you know, but there are certainly many, many fine Spanish films that come to mind, for example, like Blue Eyes of the Broken Doll, Dragonfly for Each Corpse, The Corruption of Chris Miller, various other ones that are really, really good films that are very much like Jally. But they're not really Jallo they're films. They they are Spanish films in the Jallo style, I'll say. Not everybody agrees with me on that, and that's fine. I mean, you know, some people feel very strongly that, um, you know, to um, 
limited to Italian films is ridiculous. But I, to me, it's the opposite. It only makes sense because it is a specifically, it's the, ter the term itself is Italian. So right. it should be Italian, I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. I think, uh, I mean, you could do an, a Giallo style film, but you can't, I mean, you can't really call it 100% uh, that unless it is Italian. Uh, Ron asks, what would you consider the first Giallo film? Well, we, can, we should talk a little bit about the term just by way of a little bit of background and understand that for Italian audiences, um, a thriller in general is a giallo. So there there have been thrillers made since the silent era. There was even a film in the 1930s uh, called Giallo. Um, but the first real giallo in terms of what we consider to be a giallo, which is a specifically kind of very pulpy kind of uh, stylized, um, sometimes mm -hmm. sleazy, sometimes, you know, uh, sexy, sometimes psychological or violent or whatever, but but the sort of stylized, pulpy type of thing. I think mm -hmm. the first one was Mario Bava's The Girl Who Knew Too Much from 1963, um, which is a, a relatively mild film. It's a tongue-in-cheek film. It's very Hitchcockian, the, uh, the Italian title, of course, The Girl Who Knew Too Much, uh, La Ragazza Che Sapeva Troppo. Um, is is very much you know Hitchcockian in its in its approach, but it's the first one I think that really kind of fits that. Whereas there have been things done before, like Pietro Germi done a film called uh, The Facts of Murder, for example. Uh, Ilya Petri made a film called The uh, Lassocino. Um, so there were films that were kind of like it in a way, but I think the Baba film is the first one that really kind of fits that category. And so I'd say 1963 with that film, that's the first. Gotcha. Uh, uh, <laughs> thanks for sort of giving folks out there a good starting point. Uh, Mike asks, what is your favorite Giallo leading ladies? Well, um, I, I am extraordinarily fond of Rosalba Neri in particular. Oh. I think she, uh, apart from being a stunning looking woman, was also very fine actress. And I like the fact that she could play sympathetic characters just as well as she could play very unsympathetic characters. Um, Edwige Fennec, of course, everybody loves Edwige Fennec. We already mentioned uh, Barbara Boucher, Daria Nicolodi, Ozzy Argento, um, I think, you know, did some, some really fine work for her father in the 1990s, uh, especially in the Stendhal syndrome. Um, Anita Strindberg would be another one. Um, there, there are so many different ones. I mean, Dagmar Lysander would be another one. Um, but for me, I think, you know, my my preferred Jallo leading lady probably remains Rosalba Neri. Uh, I'm with you on that. Rosalba Neri is so beautiful and, and, and Barbara Boucher. Th those two, those are for me. Uh, Gizmo asks, what would you say is the most special or crazy kill in a Gialli movie? <laughs> oh, uh, I think the one th th there are, I mean, hmm. okay, there are two that always stick in mind to me as somehow it, it feels weird to say special, but they, they just linger in mind for having a very particular impact on me. One of them I mentioned before is what happens to poor Florinda Balkan and Don't Torture a Duckling, the, uh, the uh, chain whipping sequence. Um, but also the death of Professor Giordani in Deep Red um, with the doll and the bashing of the teeth against the mantel place and all that. that. I, I have a particular phobia with regards to teeth-oriented things. Uh, you know, as somebody in my younger years who had some teeth problems, I have a real phobia with stuff like that. So to see somebody getting their teeth bashed in like that. There's also the uh, really, really painfully protracted and brutal murder of uh, Daniela Doria in New York Ripper, where she has not only her nipple uh, bisected with a razor blade, but her eyeball as well. That's pretty nasty. Um, mm -hmm. The most bizarre, I, I don't know that I can think of the most bizarre right off the top of my head. I, I should have given this more thought ahead of time in anticipation that somebody would ask me that. Uh, <laughs> Probably the most bizarre murder weapon in any of the films, um, I believe, was in um, a rather classy film, actually, called The Sunday Woman, La, Della De uh, La Donna della Monica, 
uh, with uh, Jean-Louis Trintignant and Marcello Mastriani, and uh, I think Jacqueline Bissett was in it too, uh, it was an oversized um, uh, plaster phallus. So <laughs> that was probably the strangest murder weapon in, in any of them. Uh, mm. Maybe along those lines, there was a really painful um, use of the knife as phallus in What Have You Done to Solange? So maybe I'll go with that one as the most bizarre. That's a good one. Uh, that's a good one. Uh, Michael asked, did I, <laughs> I didn't miss Choice Nips, did I? Uh, no, not not yet. Uh, <laughs> the night is young. The, the night is young. Uh, okay, one last question, then we'll jump back into the list. Uh, Jim asks, could we tackle the Lindsay Baker collaborations? How did they come about? Well, um, interestingly enough, I'm right now working on a book about Umberto Lindsay, um, who has really risen in my estimation as a filmmaker in recent years. I used to be kind of dismissive of him, probably largely down to the fact that for years you couldn't see good quality copies of a lot of his films, so it kind of obscured their qualities. Um, so interesting question that, that should come up. Um, Carol Baker had um, a very successful career going for her in Hollywood, but she made some enemies um, through being rather outspoken. And uh, she had reached a point where she kind of needed to get out of town and ended up going to Europe. I mean, it was just, you know, a good place to go. And she was regarded as a name. So her presence in a film like this was regarded as a major coup. Her first Jalo was actually a movie called The Sweet Body of Deborah, directed by Romola Guarieri in 1968. And that film was surprisingly successful. It was actually the first Jalo film that actually made a significant amount of money in Italy. Uh, mm. The Bob and stuff before that and all the other movies had not been successful in Italy at all. They were successful abroad, but not in Italy. So Carol Baker had done this film and uh, essentially the uh, the producer of Orgasmo, which was the first of the uh, of the Lindsay Jally. Sorry, my cat is starting to get into trouble. Um, <laughs> they, um, they, they, you know, kind of came up with the idea of doing something kind of like the sweet body of Deborah. And actually Lindsay originally was going to cast uh, another uh, American actress named Eleanor Parker, uh, who was a slightly older woman. And then when the idea of Carol Baker came up, he jumped on that because he thought, well, yeah, this makes this would work better because there was going to be a kind of salacious content to the film, you know, sex scenes, nudity and so forth. And it made better sense to have somebody like Carol Baker who was still young and, and in good shape and photogenic and so forth. So it just came together and they worked together very well. Lindsay was not an easy man to get along with. He could be very difficult. Um, but kind of like with Fulci, when, when he liked you and when there was a, a good rapport there, they we get along really well. And he and Baker got along well. And it was as simple as, you know, the fact that Orgasmo came out, did well. They just wanted to keep kind of keep it going. And in fact, uh, Lindsay rejected the idea of using Baker in one of his later Jally, a movie called Oasis of Fear or Ideal Place to Kill. Um, he didn't want to use her in that. I think he was getting worried he would be known as the Carol Baker director. So he got Irene Pappas instead. Um, but he did end up using her in several films. And uh, I'm so glad that they are now finally presented and preserved on uh, Blu-ray because for years, these were very difficult films to see, especially Orgasmo, which I think is uh, the best of his jolly, the first and the best. Um, that was a tough movie to see for a very long time and it exists in two very different edits and that's a nice thing about the blu-ray as well as you get both of the edits on there so yeah right. i mean uh it ended up being a good collaboration she liked him apparently and he certainly liked her he respected her so yeah they got along very well uh that's awesome okay we're going to jump back into the list guys go ahead and, and send some questions in and then we'll address those after the next the next five so i guess we'll continue with number six Troy. This is one that uh, I, is, is particularly effective. I think it's one of the, it may well be the creepiest of all of them. It's a movie by Pupi Avati called The House with the Laughing Windows uh, from 1976. And I kind of referenced this one earlier because I was talking about regional jelly. This is like uh, Don't Torture a Duckling. This is another one that's set in a sort of small backwards Italian village. And, um, it is a fantastically creepy film that builds to an ending that I certainly won't spoil here in case anybody hasn't seen it, but really, really nightmare inducing stuff. I think when you get to the end of that film, that is a tremendously creepy movie. Um, Avati had a 
flair for atmosphere that I think was comparable to Mario Bava. Um, he's very, very good with this type of material, but none of his, uh, his Jallo and horror type films have done well in Italy. So he's always kind of resisted getting too linked to that type of film. So he's always sort of bounced, bounced back and forth, made a lot of different types of films. And because of that, I don't think many people talk about him all that much because he's not really a horror guy. He's not really a Jallo guy as such. He just kind of comes in every now and again, makes something amazing, and he goes off and makes a string of movies that nobody wants to watch. Uh, not to say they're not good films, but it's just it's not the type of stuff. I mean, even when you talk about people like Lindsay, um, how many Lindsay fans have gone out of their way to see all of his early sort of swashbuckler and, and Pepla type films, for example, they're good. They should see them, but they don't want, you know, they're not interested. They want to see the sort of genre stuff. They want to see the cannibal stuff and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so Avati doesn't always get his due, but he is a really, really tremendously talented filmmaker. And this is, uh, again, uh, a very well plotted, very atmospheric, very, very, very intensely disturbing and creepy. Um, if you've seen the film, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But all those sort of scenes of listening to the recording of the artist, you know, that, that creepy voice and talking about his colors and the violence and the blood and everything else, it just gets under your skin in a, a really, really special way. He did a, um, another film later on, uh, which is a very unusual Italian zombie movie called Zetter. Uh, it was released over here, Revenge of the Dead, which yeah. is one of those movies that the sort of Fulci fans and whatnot don't tend to like because it's slow and it, not a lot happens. But, oh, boy, I'm telling you, if you stick with it, that's another one that's really, really creepy. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm familiar with Zetter. Um, that, that, is, that is a creepy one, but it is, it is very slow. For those of you who haven't seen it, I'll warn you, uh, it's, it's one you have to stick with. Uh, mm -hmm. House, of, House of Laughing Windows I have not seen, so I'm looking forward to tracking that down. It's not on Blu-ray, unfortunately, but there was um, there were a couple of DVD releases, not in the U.S. but overseas, like through the U.K. Um, I don't think the film was ever dubbed into English. Um, I, I'm pretty sure it was not. So uh, you should be able to find it with subtitles. I absolutely recommend it very highly. You need to see it. Uh, I will do. I'm going to write that one down. Uh, number seven. What is your number seven? Number seven is by far, by far, far, far my favorite of the uh, clutch of Sergio Martino Gialli. It's a movie, and actually it's the first one that he did, uh, The Strange Vice of Mrs. Ward, 1971, um, originally released over here as Blade of the Ripper. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, kind of the ultimate Edwidge Fenech film, but also the ultimate uh, George Hilton film. George Hilton, of course, being one of the great Giallo leading men, um, you know, he too had been in. Uh, the Sweet Body of Deborah back in 1968. So he's got quite a lot of Jallo credential going for him. Um, I mentioned before about these films very often, they kind of try to obscure their Italian heritage a little bit. So this one's set in Vienna and uh, it has uh, all the wonderful kind of primal trauma flashbacks, but it also has some sort of kinky blood fetishism aspects going on to the plot. Uh, this seemingly... Um, uh, prim and proper housewife who's got a dark past where she enjoyed having a state of masochistic relationship with uh, Yvonne Rasimov. Well, of course, who wouldn't enjoy that? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Yvonne Rasimov with the most intensely piercing and creepy uh, blue eyes in cinema history. He was another uh, great Jallo staple uh, staple during this uh, during the seventies. Um, showed up in a lot of Lindsay movies too. In fact. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, it, it's another one that uh, it was written by Ernesto Gastaldi, who I should mention. Ernesto Gastaldi, I think, is one of the great screenwriters of the Giallo. Um, he is uh, somebody who's worked with Bava. He wrote The Whip in the Body. He wrote uh, The uh, Horrible Dr. Hitchcock for Ricardo Freda. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a ton of different types of films, several films for Lindsay, numerous films for Sergio Martino, um, even work with Sergio Leone and so forth wrote more Jallo screenplays than anybody else, and that includes Dario Argento. Not all the films are great, not all of them are well-known, but he is very prolific, and uh, this is one of my great favorites, definitely. All the great um, great imagery in the film, and I'm not just talking about Edwidge Finek, although she's certainly a big part of that, um, but also a great Nora Orlandi soundtrack, which was uh, sampled by Tarantino on Kill Bill 2. Yeah. Oh, the music in this is really good. Yeah, and and how do you pronounce your name? Ed Ed Weech? Is that how you do, say it? Ed Weech. Ed Weech Finek. 
Ed Veach. And she is, yeah, uh, amazing looking woman. Uh, yeah, that, that, that is definitely a must watch. Um, okay, we're at uh, number eight. Well, speaking of Nora Orlandi, the composer who um, is not as well known as she should be, and she's unusual in the fact that obviously it's uh, a woman composer uh, during a time when this was not typical, especially in Italy. Um, her masterpiece is for a film by Ricardo Freda called Double Face from 1969, which was actually um, partially written by Lucio Fulci. And uh, the plot has some similarities to a giallo that Fulci made around the same time called Perversion Story, um, which is another wonderful film. But uh, this film has Klaus Kinski, who uh, Ricardo Freda, well, we should say Ricardo Freda was known as a very uh, fiery, uh, temperamental filmmaker. He was not somebody who suffered fools gladly. And if you know anything about Klaus Kinski, you know, he was not known for his sunny disposition either. So you may wonder what happened between these two. Uh, Freda referred to him as uh, the crown prince of assholes. So I think that tells you everything you need to know. Apparently Kinski um, walked off the film at a certain point and some of the scenes were accomplished with doubles and so forth. If that's true, it doesn't show. It's actually one of the relatively few films Kinski did where first of all, he's playing a, a, a sympathetic character. And second of all, he is in the entire film. Kinski very often played small roles in uh, small but flashy roles. Uh, mm. But in this film, he's in the whole film the whole way through. And uh, it's it's a giallo, but it's also an Edgar Wallace creamy. It's not actually based on an Edgar Wallace story, but it was co-produced by the same company, Rialto Film. And it was sold in a very different edit in Germany as an Edgar Wallace creamy. And of course, having Kinski in the lead, that, that just solidifies that even more. Um, Nora Orlandi, though, I think is is even more so than Kinski, the MVP here. She contributes a soundtrack for this film, which is one of my absolute favorites. This is not a Jallo film for the fans who love um, tons of action and who love gory murder sequences. There's no gore in this film. It's not it's not a body count film. It's more of a psychological film, um, but it's a really really interesting kind of. Uh, snapshot of uh, swinging London in the late 60s or at least a middle-aged man's idea of what swinging London was like you know with sort of porno loops going on and, and drug parties and so forth uh, Klaus Kinski stalking around in the trench coat in a fedora like out of a 40s film noir uh, you know trying to get the bottom of the uh, the death of his wife played by the beautiful Margaret Lee who was with Kinski in a number of films including Jess Franco's Venus and Furs which is one of my great favorites um, this it's a, it's a wonderful film, and finally was put out by Arrow within the last I don't know two or three years. After years of me hounding them to please put it out, I'm glad I they didn't do it because of me. But I'll take credit for it. <laughs> uh, yeah, if, if anybody's uh, interested, it is available during the the current Arrow sale, uh, the current half off sale. I believe uh, Diabolic DVD still had it in stock. So um, if you uh, if you want to grab it, uh, it is available there. Um, all right, we're at, uh, by the way, send, if you have any questions for Troy, send them in now. Uh, I'll be addressing them uh, fairly soon. we got two more two more titles, and then we'll go to the question section. Uh, and uh, wherever you're watching, make sure you drop that thumbs up. Please do that. Uh, that really helps the video and the channel. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, number nine, Troy. Number nine is probably a more controversial choice. I know this one is not well liked by everybody, but it is Dario Argento's The Stendhal Syndrome from 1996. Um, Argento obviously had an incredible string of successes throughout the 70s and 80s. After Opera in 1988, a lot of the Argento fans kind of checked out and said, nice knowing you, but don't like what you're doing anymore. Uh, he went to America, made a couple of films there. He did Two Evil Eyes with George Romero, which was an Edgar Allan Poe anthology. Romero's segment's not very good, but Argeno's segment is fantastic, and I don't understand why more people don't love it, because it's absolutely brilliant. And then he made, in Minneapolis of all places, a Jallo, an American Jallo called Trauma, um, which, again, I don't get it. People seem to really dislike that film, and I do not understand why. I think it's a really fine piece of work. So he finally goes back to Italy because this – Sojourn into America was a disaster commercially and uh, uh, in, in terms of his experience trying to work with American actors and American producers and so forth was not a happy experience. He goes back to Italy where he has a great deal of financial and creative freedom and he makes this film 
that is the darkest and angriest and most disturbing film that he's ever made in his career. It is completely devoid of humor, except for some very dark gallows humor. Um, it's not a conventional giallo in the sense that we learn who the killer is fairly early on. So it's not really a whodunit, but there, there are twists and turns along the way. Um, it's not the kind of fun, splashy, flashy approach to violence that you get in a lot of these films. This is a, dark and disturbing movie it deals with sexual violence deals with rape and i know that a lot of people have a, a difficult time with the fact that argeno would subject his own daughter it's acting people i mean you know i get it i understand would i want my daughter to be you know no but he's always said that on the set she's the actress he's the director and he's not going to you know change the material just because of the fact that it's his daughter they did have a tough time making the film there was there were some tense moments but Asia gives a brilliant performance in it, even though technically she really is too young. Um, but she gives a really, really wonderful performance in this film. Beautifully shot by Giuseppe Rotuno, who's an absolutely brilliant cinematographer. And it was Ennio Morricone's first film with Argeno since Four Flies and Grey Velvet. So you know, 25 years went by and they got together for this movie that um, I didn't love at first, but I deeply love now. So I'd say to anybody who maybe saw it years ago and wasn't all that nuts about it, look at it again. You might be surprised. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm one of those people that sort of watched it once. I, I, I think just one time, I'm like, yeah, it's not for me, but I'll, I'll give it a rewatch. It's definitely been a long time. Um, I will, uh, I'll definitely give it a second viewing. Um, number 10, what would be your number 10? I'll go back with Fulci again for Lizard and a Woman's Skin, 1971. Um, this, again, I mean, you know, people talk about De Palma taking from Argento and so forth. Well, how about De Palma taking from Lucio Fulci? I mean, split screen and split diopter and, and all these, you know, psychosexual head games and everything that are going on. And I'm not for a moment suggesting that he probably is even, has ever even heard of Lucio Fulci, but... Uh, Fulci was doing things in the late 60s and early 70s that De Palma became quite well known for doing later on. Uh, Lizard and Woman's Skin is, uh, it's another one that's kind of passing itself off as a, uh, a British film this time. It's set in England. It has some very familiar English actors in it, like Stanley Baker and Leo Ginn. Um, but Florinda Balkan, once again, is the star. She plays the lead. And uh, it's a really, really trippy kind of, you know, uh, it deals very much with dreams and with suppressed desires and the sort of contrast between the uptight and the free and easy. Um, but it also, uh, it, it, it speaks to kind of Fulci's interest in art and so forth. There's a lot of very Francis Bacon influenced imagery in the film. These really grotesque images and the nightmares that we see, including a wonderful moment with a sort of animated shadow of a, um, of a swan. I think it's supposed to be like a giant swan that we see. It's a beautiful shot. Uh, and of course, it's the famous instance too, where uh, Fulci was brought into court on animal cruelty charges. Um, even though he, he never did that. He wasn't like some of his contemporaries. He didn't make uh, a cannibal film where he went to the jungle and, and slaughtered, you know, animals uh, for the sake of a movie. Uh, these were fake dogs that were constructed by Carlo Rambaldi. And he was actually, the story goes anyway, and it almost sounds too good to tr be true, which means it's probably not quite true. But the story goes that he was he was really very close to getting into uh, either being put in jail or being given a heavy fine when Carlo Rambaldi came in with these fake dogs and uh, like something out of Perry Mason. You know, my, my client is innocent. Um, <laughs> it produced the fake dogs. And, uh, yeah, it's just a brilliant special effect where Florida Balkan goes into a room at one point. Uh, for reasons we never really understand why it, it's there. I mean, what what could they possibly be doing? But there's all these vivisected dogs that are whimpering in pain and they're they're attached to machines and God knows what's going on. It's a startling image. Um, I guess some people find the ending a little disappointing because it is kind of a classical Agatha Christie type of, you know, gotcha moment where the killer is apprehended. It's almost like a Columbo type thing, but it works for me. Very well acted. Again, beautifully shot and uh, great Ennio Morricone score. And absolutely, I think, one of Fulci's best. Um, yeah, I, I concur with that. Um, we have a question from Gizmo that, uh, I don't know, maybe he's thinking of, of, uh, of Lizard. He says, the dog in Tenebra, why that scene? I have looked everywhere to find out why he wanted that scene in the film. And I believe that dog is the best actor. I don't remember a dog in Tenebra. 
In Tenebrae, there's the dog where the dog chases uh, Laura Wendell. If you remember when she has oh, her, oh, okay, she yeah. fights with Michele Suave, who plays her boyfriend on the motorcycle right. or scooter, or whatever. Um, oh, I don't know. I mean, you know, why does he have anything in his movies? <laughs> it, just, <laughs> it, it just makes for a great scene, and of course, it also it 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 enables her to get trapped in the killer's lair. That's probably ultimately the the whole point that she has right. to have a reason why she can't just leave. She's terrified to leave because the dog is outside. And he, that is one hell of a dog actor, whatever the dog's real name was. Um, he did really, really well. So yeah, that's a, that's a great sequence. That is, that, that is a really good sequence. Um, if you guys have any more questions, send them in and we're just going to continue with the list. Um, okay. We're at 11. Uh, more Argento with opera from 1988. I mean, okay. this is his big, lavish, you know, ultimate experiment and technique. This is him using every piece of technology that was available to him at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, that incredible crane shot that uh, George Romero loved so much with the uh, point of view of the, uh, of the ravens inside of the opera house. Beautiful stuff. I mean, the camera is just constantly moving and gliding and doing things that uh, I still don't entirely understand how it was done. Uh, but it's beautiful. I mean, the, the film, um, it's kind of a variation on a Phantom of the Opera in a way, um, which makes his decision to later make a version of Phantom of the Opera all the more strange in a, in, in a sense. Although I'm one of the very few people in the world who actually rather likes his version of Phantom of the Opera. But opera is much better. Um, and it definitely... It's a fan favorite, except for the ending. Uh, again, the ending seems to bother a lot of people. It bothered me the first couple of times I watched it, but I wouldn't change it now. Um, you know, the whole kind of reuniting with nature kind of thing that happens at the end of the film with, with our protagonist, which is ambiguous enough that it makes you wonder, okay, is it is it some sort of a uh, new agey type of thing that he's putting in there, or is the idea that she's gone completely crazy? That's hard to say, but... Uh, uh, I particularly like the character of the director in the film played by Ian Charlson, who was actually um, in the early stages of AIDS when he made this film. Uh, nobody knew uh, when he was hired. Um, he knew he was not well, but he was hiding it. He was terrified that if the news got out to the British press, he would be ruined. And of course, he was right. He would have been. Um, so it was kind of kept on the down low until he actually had an accident during the filming. He was off, uh, you know, just uh, driving around, apparently. Uh, he was, uh, well, he was Scottish, but, you know, used to driving on, you know, quote unquote, the wrong side of the road. And he was on the wrong side of the road and got into an accident. And oh, it was you know, when he went into the hospital, it, they found that there was something up. And Argento, to his credit, just, you know, said, you know what, we're not going to we're not going to do anything about this. We we'll, we won't say anything about it. We won't let anything out to the press. We're just going to keep filming. Uh, was that just him being a good guy or was it just him saying, I don't want to have to refilm all of this stuff? You know, I don't know. But still, I mean, I give him a lot of credit because a lot of people in the 80s would have been only too eager to have gotten rid of him just because he had AIDS, because everybody was terrified they would get AIDS, too, if he was in close proximity. But he's wonderful in the film and he's very funny. And he has um, he has a kind of similar character to what. Anthony Franciosa plays in Tenebrae where he's the creator who's kind of an Argento stand in a way. Uh, but mm -hmm. what's interesting is that in both cases, Argento makes his stand in kind of not such a great guy. So it's kind of, he's not a particularly heroic character. He's kind of nasty in some respects, but again, it's that kind of, you know, commentary on the artist and the art and, and the relationship between the art and the public and so forth. So, ah, it's, it's a magnificent film. I mean, um, Technically, it's it's as uh, sophisticated as anything he ever made. Yeah, I yeah, I would I would say it's very technically sophisticated. That's that's a good way to put it. I mean, yeah, the, the crane shot alone. There, there's so much good stuff in that. It's it's a, it is it is it is a film students movie. That's how I describe it. <laughs> it has that definitely gives that uh, good uh, uh, good good stuff for all the film students to cream their jeans over, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Um. Number 12. Uh, this is another kind of Argento knockoff, but it's a good one. It's called The Black Belly of the Tarantula from 1972, directed mm -hmm. by Paolo Guevara, who was um, one of the sort of uh, godfathers of the Mondo film. He was involved in the uh, original Mondo Cane. Um, he didn't stick with it as um, Jacopetti and Prosperi went on and made a, a whole series of films, but he was 
he was there in the beginning and he went on to make a really interesting film called the wild eye which was kind of almost a commentary on that whole mondo thing the mondo uh kind of explosion that took place i think mm-hmm. he had some ambivalent feelings about that um Kavar is not a terribly well-known director in america unfortunately he doesn't tend to get his due I had thought about doing a book about him at one point, but unfortunately there's, there's just too much of his stuff that's not available in English friendly versions. If that ever changes, maybe I would change my mind. Cause I mean, it's one thing if you have one or two films, but when you have a bunch and the guy didn't even really make a ton of movies, it's, mm. it's hard to justify that. But he made a couple of interesting jelly, another one later on called uh, plot of fear that I'm rather fond of, but uh, black belly, the tarantula has Giancarlo Giannini, who is probably best known to American viewers for playing uh, commandatory Patsy in Hannibal. He has that great scene where he is um, eviscerated by Hannibal Lecter, um, you know, in, in, in the Ridley Scott film. And he was also in uh, the first two of the Daniel Craig, James Bond movies. Um, one of those guys, I mean, he worked with Visconti, he worked with Lena Wertmuller. I mean, he was, you know, a great kind of art house icon, but he also did some jolly as well, in, including this film where he plays an uncommonly complex and very human police inspector. Very often the inspectors in these movies are not very interesting. They're not very sympathetic, but here's a guy who is struggling with doubts and he's got a home life and he's got some kind of cute interactions with his wife and his wife gets into danger. So you you have an emotional involvement in it. The plot isn't necessarily the greatest plot in the world, but it does for the risk. This will be my pervy moment here. I don't want to get too pervy, but it has probably the greatest opening of any Jallo film ever made because it does involve a, a nude body massage for Barbara Boucher. So, you know, you can't go wrong with that. Uh, yes. Uh, that, that, that is one of the great openings. Uh, <laughs> uh, rim shot there. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, 13. <laughs> 13. Well, I mean, at this point, we're really in no kind of order, but um, Black uh, Belly of the Trench already did. Bird with the Crystal Plumage, of course, Dario Argento's first uh, film. Um, it has been said not very charitably, but not entirely inaccurately. He spent all of his life pretty much remaking this movie. Um, the great plot twist in it is always something he's tried to outdo, and he did outdo it, I think, in um, Deep Red, um, whereas in other films like Sleepless, Eh, not so much. He tried, but it doesn't <laughs> quite hang together so good. No. Um, it's, you know, it's again, it's the great sort of fish out of water story with the American writer in Rome. Um, he's there on, you know, working on a, a, a book project, something he's doing strictly for the cash and uh, gets involved in an attempted murder. And then, you know, like all good Jallo protagonists decides to play amateur detective and becomes very obsessed with it all. And, um, it's it's the great it's a template for everything that Argeno would do later. Tony Misanti is great in it. He plays the lead. Argeno hated him. Uh, Misanti was very surprised to hear this. He thought they got along very well. Argento absolutely hated them. Um, but uh, any tension does not show on screen because he he makes for a great lead. Argeno, incidentally, Argeno hated Anthony Franciosa as well for Tenebrae, and you wouldn't guess that either because Franciosa is also wonderful. So you never know. Um, but it's wow. it's also got some really funny stuff in it too, particularly a great sequence with Mario Adorf playing a uh, artist, an eccentric artist, who it turns out eats cats. Um, but it's got a couple of the great quotes. Um, Adorf's character is talking about the artwork that he's doing, and he says, um, "I only paint mystical scenes these days." And Sam Dalmas, the Tony Masanti character, says, "Why?" And he says, "Why? Because I feel mystical. If it's any of your damn business." So I love that. <laughs> And, of course, also the great scene with the lineup of uh, the sex offenders and uh, the, uh, the the policeman says, right, bring in the perverts. Uh, you could almost write a book about Jally and call it right, bring in the perverts. So <laughs> good stuff. <clears throat> that would, I, 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 I think people would just, uh, even people who are not even familiar with it, be like, wait, what? And they'd pick it up. You know, you, you might even introduce some new fans to the to the genre if you, if you, if you titled it that. I might not want that, but that's up to that. Um, okay, uh, I guess uh, we're at uh, 14. This is one that um, I should explain. When I wrote my Mario Bava book, as I said before, my, the initial iteration of it was written when I was in college. Um, that was many years ago. So I've done a updated version of the book since then. And when I updated it uh, for the more recent version, 
um, I found that I thought that I was really hard on this movie back in the day. I didn't like it very much back then, and I love it now. It's Hatchet for the Honeymoon, um, which was a troubled production, um, had sort of a stop and start filming, but ultimately came out in 1970. Um, it's an interesting one because we were talking before about nationality and so forth. This was a uh, Italian-Spanish co-production, and there's a good deal of Spanish um, money in the film. There's a good deal of Spanish location filming in the movie. Uh, they actually filmed it partially at the uh, the villa of Generalissimo Francisco Franco, the dictator of Spain. And uh, Bava, Bava was a very self-deprecating man. He also had a very sardonic sense of humor. And it may or may not be true, but he said that the reason there wasn't much blood in the movie was because when they were filming in Franco's villa, they didn't dare get any blood on the carpet. Otherwise, they would have been shot. Um, may or may not be true, but uh, it's kind of, it's it's a little bit of a variation on, an, on a Bunuel film from the 1950s called The Criminal Life of Archibaldo del Cruz. Um, it deals with, a uh, again, a fashion house setting, a, a fashion designer, uh, kind of almost a living mannequin himself who has major mommy issues mm -hmm. and uh, has to, uh, you know, has this, this peculiar fetish and psychosis connected to wedding dresses and, and the whole ritual of the honeymoon and so forth, which leads him to kill. Um, a little bit of a riff on Psycho as well, of course, but uh, it's a movie that is also interesting because it has a supernatural component. And uh, that's one of those things where I struggle. You know, is it a Jallo? Is it not a Jallo? It's not a whodunit because we know who did it right from the very beginning. He announces right off the bat, my name is John Harrington and I'm a, I'm a what does he call himself? Uh, I don't think he calls himself a psychopath, paranoic, paranoic, a charming mm -hmm. word. He says. Um, so we know who we know who did it, um, but it's a why done it. So what what is the thing that compels him to kill? And that's the mystery of the film. But there is a supernatural element, too, because he ends up killing his wife. And there's this whole thing where she's haunting him. Well, you might think, well, it's just his guilty conscience or whatever. But there are moments where other people see her. So clearly there is something supernatural going on here. So it's one of the movies that's kind of iffy. You know, is it really a Jallo? Is it not? Baba's Jally after Blood and Black Lace got more and more experimental and more and more quirky. So uh, I think it fits, but I can understand why some people might disagree. Uh, copy that. Yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure I have this on, on DVD and I've, I've watched it in the past. It's been a while. I've got to revisit that. We've got a lot of Bava stuff. Uh, well, everything that was that 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 came out back in the day. So I, I've I've got to do a deep dive. It's been a while since I watched all his stuff. Uh, by the way, everybody who's watching, if you're new here, uh, drop me a thumbs up and subscribe. Master Chaos loves you very much, and if you like this kind of content, I hope you'll join the party. And I'll uh, I'll, I'll be bringing Troy. We'll come back. Uh, I have Nathaniel Thompson coming in a, in a couple weeks. We will be chatting movies as well. So if you're new here. Please subscribe. Okay, number 15. Well, I mentioned this one earlier. Uh, what have you done to Solange, which was directed by Massimo D'Alemano, who was a, uh, like Bava, a cinematographer before he was a director. He photographed uh, Sergio Leone's first two Westerns, Fistful of Dollars and For a Few Dollars More. Very fine cinematographer. And he was a very good director. He's another guy that, um, you know, if it weren't for the fact, you know, unfortunately he died a little on the young side. He was he was killed uh, in a car crash. Um, he wasn't super young. He's about sixty, but he he was he was killed, you know, before his time. Clearly, he didn't end up making a ton of movies. So it's one of those things, you know. I I, I would like to do something about him at some point, but I don't know if there's enough there to justify an entire book because he didn't really make a ton of films. But the ones he made, I think, are all really interesting, and I've seen them all, um, and some of them I really, really like, and this is certainly one of the very best. Um, this is another one that it has German financing, mm -hmm. and it's it was sold in Germany as a creamy. It was sold in, in uh, Germany as a Edgar Wallace film. I think they called it The Curse, uh, the Case of the Green Pin, something like that. Um, there was no such Edgar Wallace book by that title, but that didn't stop them. It's like American International with their Edgar Allan Poe films that had nothing to do with Edgar Allan Poe after a certain point. Um, 
so it has a couple of the German actors familiar from those films. If you've ever watched any of the creamy films from the 60s, mm. people like uh, Joachim Fuchsberger playing the police inspector and Karen Ball. But the lead is, of course, very Italian, very macho Fabio Testi playing the uh, gym teacher who can't keep it in his pants, who is making it with the girls at the school, which makes him not only unfaithful, but also a pervert because these girls are underage. Um so it's an interesting film, very morally ambiguous, to say the least, shot by Joe D'Amato, um, who, again, talking to people who were cinematographers before they became a director, uh, Joe D'Amato, back when he was just good old-fashioned uh, Arista Massachusetts, photographed this film, and uh, Ennio Morricone did another extraordinary soundtrack for it, and uh, mm-hmm. it, as I mentioned before, has some really, it's not a graphically gory film but it's very disturbing because it's dealing with things you know to do with very sexualized violence and also the theme of abortion which comes into it um so it's a very um it's a very grubby film in some respects but um dare i say it's as tasteful as a movie like that can be and i think very engaging as well uh, absolutely uh, before we do the last five let's uh, answer a couple questions here Jim asks, what do you think is the most underappreciated Giallo film? There are so many that I think don't tend to get their due. I mean, I mentioned before the Stendhal syndrome and trauma, both of which I think really they deserve to be reassessed. There is a really interesting one from the late 60s. I think it came out in 68 called Hyena in the Safe. It's another great title, Hyena in the Safe. Tell me you wouldn't go to see a movie called that. If you yeah. saw it on the TV. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good sort of pop art giallo film from the late 60s that nobody's ever heard of um, that unfortunately it, it doesn't have any name value it's just one of those things that doesn't have any of the big names attached to it but it's a really interesting little movie mm. um, Double Face I mentioned before I think is another one that doesn't tend to get the, the love and attention it gets uh, New York Ripper although it has a big following um, is terribly misunderstood in many respects. So I, I would I would add that one in there as well. But uh, I mean, you know, that's just for starters. Um, there was a uh, Alberto De Martino film I mentioned before called uh, Strange Shadows in an Empty Room, also known as Blazing Magnum. That's another one that I think uh, doesn't always get the respect and attention that it deserves. So there's a lot of good ones out there that don't get all the press and all the attention, usually because they're not made by one of the big Jallo filmmakers. Right. Uh, Gizmo asks, is it true that Fulci has an unfinished horror film that never got to post-production? I think they talked about that on the doc, a movie from the late seventies. Not that I know of. I, there's, there's a certain amount of misinformation out there as far as, uh, well, a lot of these people are concerned. Uh, I am not aware personally of anything that he actually started that didn't get finished. There were a lot of films that came close to being made. There were various different projects like the mummy, for example, he was going to do in the early eighties, a version of the mummy. Um, there were, you know, a variety of other projects as well that, uh, came close to getting off the ground, but never did. Of course, he was originally supposed to direct the wax mask for Dario Argento. Unfortunately, oh. he passed away before that could happen. Um, I am not aware, though, and uh, I would think with everything that I have, uh, uh, not to call myself a Fulci expert, I, I'm not that pompous, I, but I know a good bit about Fulci, we'll put it that way. I'm not familiar with anything that he started that never got finished. If I'm wrong, I'll admit it, but I'm not familiar with that. Okay. Um, uh, actually, yes, uh, this was the question I was looking for. Thank you for uh, resetting it uh Nicomedes, uh, I haven't heard Mimsy Farmer mentioned yet. I thought she did some great work in Giallo. What's Mr. Howard's, Howard's take on her? She's an odd one. She's very much a love it or hate it kind of an actress. There's a frosty, brittle quality to her that can be very off-putting. Uh, I am not always a big fan of hers, but when I like her, I like her a lot. I think she's very good in Autopsy, your Armando Crispino Giallo. Um, that was recently put out on Blu-ray by Vinegar Syndrome. Um, that's a really committed and very, very strong performance. She's, it's tough to say. I think she's deliberately, I think Argeno wanted her to be very flat for Flies and Grey Velvet until that great scene at the end where she she snaps. And then that's a great actor showcase when she does that. That's a very effective performance uh, on that level. For the most part, she kind of disappears into the background of the film, but I, I think that was probably intentional. Um, 
there's an interesting film that she did that is sometimes called a giallo. I don't consider it to be a giallo. I think it's more of a psychological horror film. It's closer to something like a repulsion uh, by Polanski than, than a giallo, but a movie called Perfume of a Lady in Black, Francisco Barilli film, which is a really interesting film with an unforgettable climax. If you haven't seen it, I won't spoil it for you. But um, th she was really interesting and really good playing those types of neurotic strange uh slightly disconnected characters i find her far less effective in a kind of conventional heroine role in fulci's black cat for example which is a movie i like a lot but i'm not crazy about her in it um there's there's something that brittle quality to me doesn't really work for a character like that uh, and that's probably partly down to the script too there's just not much for her to do but give her a really interesting kind of edgy character to play and she's very interesting and a very striking presence too and a slightly androgynous kind of quality which made her very different from uh, a lot of the more kind of you know va -va -va boom type girls that were in a lot of these films so she um she certainly definitely stood out from the pack gotcha there you go okay let's uh let's uh showcase the last five on your top 20 list um what would be uh 16 well, we're going to get into Lindsay territory here. I, I, mean, I have a few from Lindsay, actually, from this point on. He made eight jolly uh, through his career. And one of the points that I'm kind of making in the book that I'm writing about him is that um, I would not argue he's a great auteur, but I think he was a uh, an interesting filmmaker who, like Fulci, managed to work in a variety of different genres and did some really interesting work. Mm -hmm. There were certain things he did really well, and one of them was Jally. He was actually really, really good with, with these films, and uh, I quite like his Jally. Um, if I were to go back and look at So Deadly, So Perverse, I know I was not very kind about a lot of the films at that time. Well, opinions change over time, and I've, I've grown to like some of them much, much more now as time has gone on. Yeah. It helps, too. I've seen better versions. But the one I'd start off with is Orgasmo, um, which was the first that was the uh, the first Carol Baker, uh, Umberto Lenzi collaboration, made in 68, came out in 69. Um, it's funny because the a couple of the films are titled so similarly, there's all this confusion. Orgasmo was originally supposed to be called Paranoia, but they decided to call it Orgasmo in Italy, which Lenzi was not happy about. He didn't like that title. He thought it should have been kept as, orga as uh, Paranoia. They did call it Paranoia in the United States. Well, then a couple of years later, they put out another film called Paranoia, also directed by Umberto Lenzi and starring Carol Baker, um, which is called in America, A Quiet Place to Kill. Um, subsequent to that, Lenzi makes another giallo, which in Italy is called An Ideal Place to Kill. So <laughs> it's very confusing what films you're talking about. Uh, in some sort of it's like some sort of cosmic joke that's being played on the audience because you know which movie are you talking about um, but orgasmo is uh, really interesting too because as I alluded to before there are two different edits the American version is a lot saucier it has the full frontal nudity it has uh, longer sex scenes and so forth but the plot is somewhat changed they decided to change it in a way to make Carol Baker character a little bit more sympathetic the Italian version is a little more chaste but it's got a little bit more plot and there is a character, a very shadowy, mysterious character that is seen through the film, a guy with a club foot who turns out to be a police inspector. Um, he's not quite cut altogether from the American version. So it gets a little confusing what he is and what his purpose is because there's no payoff for him in the American version, whereas in the Italian version mm -hmm. is. It's one of those things, again, I don't want to say too much about it for the benefit of people who have, maybe haven't seen it because this is a tough movie to see for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm glad that it's finally been rescued, as I said before. I think it's a really, really fine film, very well plotted, um, and uh, just a, a great example of kind of a, a chamber piece giallo, very much in the mold of Diabolique, which was kind of the uh, the model for a lot of these late 60s kind of sexy giallo. Yeah, uh, Orgasmo has a great finale, too. It's uh, it, it's, uh, it's a shocker. I like that one. Um, uh, do you have any thoughts on the remake, the American remake, Orgasmo? <laughs> that, that, that's the confusion too, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> at least, there, at least you got a Z in the title. Well, it's the same thing. Lindsay did a, 
it's funny, you know, Lindsay made a film called Eaten Alive, which uh, featured the American actor Mel Ferrer, who was also in Toby Hooper's Eaten Alive. So wow. <laughs> it gets confusing, too. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, um, 17. Next. Well, another Lindsay Baker movie I've uh, really done a turnaround on because I wasn't all that crazy about it when I first saw it, but I really like it a lot now. It's so sweet, so perverse. Obviously, I always like the title because I kind of, you know, um, paid homage to it with my Jello books. Um, but mm -hmm. of course, this came out in 1969. Um, it's the second of their films in order of production um, with Jean-Louis Trintignant, who was uh, and he is a great French actor who has a lot of kind of art house connotations. But he's one of those guys who kind of was able to bounce back and forth between doing the kind of, you know, a Latin Grebrio uh, sort of art house uh, type pictures, you know, Roger Vadim and people like that. And then coming and doing uh, a Lenzi Giallo or a, a Sergio Cabucci Western, like uh, the great silence, for example. Yes. Um, which is a great film, but mm. um, this, again, it's, it's one of the great sort of diabolique riffs. It's dealing very much with the whole idea of the, um, the uh, the psychologically fragile character being manipulated by amoral bastards, effectively, uh, usually wants to get their hands on some money or some property or something like that. The idea of driving them insane, either that they get committed or they end up uh, dying as a result. So uh, a lot of fun, great resort to Lenny soundtrack. Um, and it's got all the great sort of scenery and, and late sixties kind of costumes and uh, decor and so forth. that makes those films so very special. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of that one. I love, I love him. I think he's a great actor. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Uh, what about 18? Well, we'll go back to full sheet who, um, actually didn't even make as many uh, Jally as Lindsay. He did six, but uh, all six of them, again, are, are really well worth seeing. And this is one from 1977 called The Psychic, um, which was unfortunately a bit of a commercial fiasco when it came out in 1977. It was an expensive film. It did not do well. Um, it actually came at kind of a bad time in Fulci's life because this was during the period when his uh, daughter Camilla was... Um, very, very badly injured in a horse riding accident. Um, if you've seen Fulci for Fake, um, they talk a good deal about that um, in, in that documentary. It was a pretty trying period for him. His first Jallo perversion story was also timed around the time that his, uh, his first wife, uh, Marina, had committed suicide because she had inoperable cancer. So yeah. he had some, some bad drama in his life. It's not a surprise that he was the way that he was. Mm -hmm. um, this is, uh, you know, again, getting into sort of paranormal here because it's it's dealing with psychic phenomena and so forth. It has kind of an Edgar Allan Poe vibe to it. And we even have a premature burial kind of theme that goes on at the end of the film. Um, great uh, Fabio Fritzi soundtrack, especially the uh, the central theme um, that's uh, very reminiscent of kind of the uh, the music uh, from the uh, the wristwatch and uh, Sergio Leone's for a few dollars more. This kind of haunting theme that goes throughout the film, which again Tarantino took and used um, in the first Kill Bill, so mm. that's good stuff. And uh, I, I'm not entirely crazy about Jennifer O'Neill's central performance in the film. I think she's a little wooden, but uh, she's supported by a really great cast: uh, Marco Perel and Johnny Garco and so forth. And uh, it, it's a movie that again it had money in it, and you can see that throughout the movie. It's it's beautifully shot. Uh, lots of interesting locations, really interesting varied locations, and uh, great camera work, and uh, an opening that quotes the ending of "Don't Torture a Duckling" with a uh, a sequence of admittedly not a very convincing dummy um, plunging down a cliff. Uh, in this case, it's the White Cliffs of Dover, where um, the face is sort of shredded against the uh, the rocks as it's on its way down. It's one of those things that. It's admittedly a bit phony looking, but I love the audacity of it. Yes, uh, absolutely. I, I love Gianni Garco. He's one of my favorites, man. He's uh, his stuff is great. Well, yeah, he was he was another one. He was in a lot of the spaghetti westerns. He was Sartana, and uh, yeah, he's he's very good in this. He actually played a part that I believe was originally supposed to be play, played by Claudio Casanelli, who's another um, you know stalwart during this period as well. Gotcha. Um, okay, uh, 19, I think? Yeah. 
We'll go with another Lenzi, and this one is probably the most overtly Argento of Lenzi's Jolly, and it's Seven Bloodstained Orchids from 1972, which stars Antonio Sabato, not the underwear model, that's his son, but uh, <laughs> uh, the, the elder Antonio Sabato, this muy macho Antonio Sabato with his mustache and, uh, you know, uh, padded shoulders <laughs> going through the film. Um, great supporting cast, Marissa Mel and, and uh, Pierre Palacaponi and so forth. A lot of familiar faces if you watch a lot of these movies. Um, another great score by Rizzo Artelani, although it's all, I, I, apart from the main theme, which may be an original composition, everything else was taken from other Ortolani scores. A lot of it's from the So Sweet, So Perverse soundtrack, as a matter of fact. It's got some great murder sequences, um, a good solid plot. And uh, again, you know, I think a really beautifully shot film. I think it's one of Lindsay's best looking movies. Um, Angelo Lati did the cinematography on this one. And it's, uh, it's a really, really good looking movie. And I think uh, immensely entertaining. I mean, it, it's nothing groundbreaking. It doesn't reinvent the wheel. But if you're looking for a good Argento style body count giallo, um, and, and a lot of the plot is taken actually uncredited from a Cornell Woolrich, uh, book called Rendezvous in Black. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why it wasn't credited, but on the other hand, Argeno didn't credit, uh, Frederick Brown's, uh, The Screaming Mimi on Bird of the Crystal Plumage, and he didn't credit, uh, Woolrich on, uh, Four Flies and Grey Velvet either. So, you know, I guess people were sort of magpie taking ideas from here and there, but, uh, good, good, solid little movie. I'm very, very fond of. Uh, excellent. Um, okay, I guess last one, uh, number 20. <clears throat> well, number 20, I'm going to go with uh, uh, another Massimo D'Alemano film, and that's What Have They Done to Your Daughters, which is a, um, is a uh, kind of um, giallo poliziotesco hybrid. Um, it's another very grubby, very disturbing um, very unsettling type of film. Uh, again, with the sort of schoolgirl in peril theme, which is automatically a bit cringeworthy, but this one in particular is getting into some really, uh, really nasty and, and gynecological details, let's say, about uh, some of the things that, that happen to the victims. And mm -hmm. it's not graphically shown, although the film is a lot bloodier than what have they done to Solange. Um, including a really memorably nasty sequence where a guy's hand is bisected with a, a meat cleaver. Very brutal. The weird thing about this one is the ultimate reveal of the killer. It almost doesn't matter. I mean, it's, it's, it's a secondary character barely registers who it is. It's just the fact that uh, they're up to this awful thing. And it's, it turns out to be a conspiracy, which runs very deep. So it's a very bitter, angry film that ends with, um, I think the earliest instance of the F bomb being dropped in a Jallo, at least that I can think of. So, um, um, Claudio Casanelli plays the lead, and then I mentioned him before. Um, he's quite good as this kind of cynical police inspector who's trying to get to the bottom of the crimes. Mario Adorf uh, from *Bird with Crystal Plume is the cat, the cat eating artist from *Bird with the Crystal Plumage plays a more, much more sympathetic character this time. And Farley Granger, who had been in um, Hitchcock's *Rope* and *Strangers on a Train*. Um, he's in it very briefly, but I think makes a nice impression as the father of one of the victims. So good stuff. Again, another movie that Arrow has rescued and put out on Blu-ray. If you're not familiar with it, well, we're seeing. Uh, absolutely. Uh, l let's do an honorable mention, because uh, I know this was on the list at one point. I, 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 I'm pretty sure we didn't talk about it. Uh, Bay of Blood, Twitch of the Death Nerve. You're right. You're right. And uh, I omitted that one by accident. I'm going by memory here. So, yes, Twitch of the Death Nerve. Well, that's the title I always use. And the only reason I use that title so much is it's just such a wonderful title. I've never actually seen a print with that title on the screen, though. So, mm -hmm. But I have seen advertising, news, newspaper advertising with that title. And Twitch of the Death Nerve, I mean, that's one of the all-time great titles. Every version I've ever seen is either called uh, Reazione a Catena, which uh, translates as uh, Chain Reaction, or A Bay of Blood. That's what most mm -hmm. people probably know it as. So that poster there, of course, that's the... Uh, uh, it's either the French or the Belgian poster. I can't remember off the top of my head, but that is uh, that is a Bay of Blood. It's one of the great. Um, I mean, arguably the template for the slasher film. I mean, along yeah. with Sergio Martino's Torso, it definitely was one of the ones that that set the stage. 
it has been said that Sean Cunningham ripped it off for Friday the 13th. I'm not, I don't entirely buy that. I think there's some truth to it. Uh, what happened with uh, Bay of Blood is interesting. It was released at one point by Hallmark releasing, not the Hallmark channel, but Hallmark releasing, um, which was uh, the company that put out Last House on the Left. Of course, Sean Cunningham uh, was involved in that film very famously. And they put it out as Last House on the Left Part Two, even though it was made a year before Last House on the Left. They repackaged it, sold it as a sequel, yeah. uh, which is ridiculous. But it's quite possible he saw the film. I would not be surprised if he was intrigued by, well, what is this Last House on the Left Part Two? And he, he might have looked at it. Pays to remember, too, though, he didn't write Friday the 13th. Uh, Victor Miller did. Victor Miller has gone on record many times as saying he doesn't like horror movies. So I don't know that anybody was deliberately trying to rip off Bay of Blood or Twitch of the Death Nerve or Carnage or whatever you want to call it. But it has a lot of the same elements. It, it has a section in the film in the middle where it focuses on the kind of prototypical horny teenagers who go to this uh, cabin out in the woods and are gradually being picked off one by one. Chain Reaction of the Italian title is great because it, it is a movie that is continuously surprising the viewer because you open up with a murder, camera pans up, and you see who did it. He gets killed, somebody off screen, and it just continues. It's 13 major characters and 13 people get killed. So it's uh, Bob is Gori's film. I think it was his response to the success of the Argento films and the Fulci films and so forth. Um, his attempt to kind of keep up with the kids, so to speak, and, and show that he could do something like that. And he did, did it beautifully. Um, has great makeup effects by Carlo Rimbaldi. The um, the hatchet that goes in the face uh, at one point, that's magnificent. I mean, this this was a movie made for pennies uh, in 1971, and that effect still holds up beautifully. And of course, it has the uh, the, the couple in bed having sex who get shish kebabed, um, which was used in Friday the 13th Part 2. Mm -hmm. um, Claudio Volante, uh, who plays one of the characters, has a sweater that's very much like the sweater that Mrs. Voorhe wear, Voorhees wears in, in Friday the yeah. 13th. Yeah. So it does make you wonder. It's it's the setting, you know, by the lake and so forth, and uh, or by the bay, and uh, the horny teens and some of the murder sequences. I can see why people say it's it, it was ripped off. I, again, I'm not entirely sure how much of that is true, how much of a coincidence. But it is a very witty film, too. It's very deliberately, very mm -hmm. dark comedy. And uh, it's, to me, it's very funny. I watched the film and I just I, I chuckle the whole way through because it's just basically one scummy person after another getting their just desserts while everybody's just trying to get their hands on some property, this beautiful property by the bay. So, yeah, that's a wonderful film. I'm glad you mentioned it because it was indeed on my list and I forgot about it. Oh, no, no worries. I, I brought it up because I love that movie so much. That, that was the first Mario Bava movie I watched. And I'm like, oh, man, I got to watch more of this guy's stuff. It wow. is. It, it's, if, for those of you who haven't seen it, we're not going to spoil anything. But it is, it is nonstop, and there's tons of kills, and it's just so fun. I, I highly recommend that movie. Um, obviously everything on this list has been great, but, uh, Bay of Blood. Yeah, that's, that, that would be my number one. That one to never. Uh, yeah. again, I, I wish, I wish I could say that I've, I, I've ever seen a print that is called Twitch of the Death Nerve. I don't know if it ever actually had that title on screen. Maybe really? somebody out there knows that I, I, I've never seen it. I just love that title. That's why I always call it that, even though I know it as a, a Bay of Blood, that's what's on every copy I have, but. A Twitch of the Death Nerve is just such a wonderful title. That is a cool title, for sure. Uh, speaking of titles, uh, Mr. Tony the Dead asks, Troy, what's your favorite super long Giallo title? <laughs> I always screw it up. Your vice is the locked door. It's either your vice is a locked door or your vice is a locked room and only I have the key. Okay, that's good. That's good. Uh, Which was uh, actually uh, taken, the title was taken, I think that was a letter that was either from, that was written to the character that Ebi Chvanek played, either in um, Mrs. Ward or in All the Colors of the Dark, I can't remember, but she gets a note at one point and it says that, and Ernesto Gastaldi, who wrote all those films, thought, hmm, that'd be a good title, so they put it on. Uh, it's, a, it's certainly a mouthful, but I think it's really good. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, well, guys, we're gonna uh, we're about to wrap it up. If you have any last minute questions, uh, send them in now. 
Uh, but we're, we're, we're closing in on the end of our time with Troy. Uh, so while you guys formulate any last minute questions, Troy, uh, tell us what's coming up for you. Uh, you, you, you're working on some books. Tell us all about that. Well, um, I have a book about the, it's, it's kind of an American Jello called Alice, sweet Alice, <clears throat> although the original title was communion. Uh, the book is called Unholy Communion, Alice, Sweet Alice from script to screen. Um, which uh, should be out here pretty soon from Bear Manor. It, it, uh, it has a very lengthy interview with the writer-director, Alfred Soule, but also um, kind of background on the film, uh, contextual information on what the genre was like and you know, how it was changing during the 1970s. And um, the script, I mean, the actual shooting script of the film. So you can see you know, from reading it how it changed from the script to what we have in the film now. So that book should be out uh, hopefully within the next couple of weeks, I would think. I'm working on a book about Umberto Lenzi, um, which is shaping up very well. I'm actually very excited about it called Make Them Die Slowly. Of course, that's the um, the American title for Cannibal Ferox. Um, but, uh, you know, why not use it? It works. So I have that for the title. Um, that's what I'm working on now. And a variety of, of commentaries, of course, to record as well. Uh, many of them with Nathaniel Thompson, who I've been recording with now for a couple of years. And uh, always great pleasure working with him. I've got some some good stuff coming up. I can't say right now, but some good stuff coming up that hopefully will be announced within the next, um, well, within the next few months, at least with some of these. Uh, sometimes you record and it doesn't come out for, you know, well, uh, I've recorded a track, you know, and, and the disc doesn't come out for a year afterwards. So you never know, but uh, there will be some announcements coming pretty soon. <clears throat> that's, that's very exciting. I can't wait. I love, I love your commentary tracks very much. Well, thank you. Uh, let's see a couple of questions here to round things out. Gizmo says probably a stupid question, but I am the best with stupid <clears throat> questions. Um, was body puzzle considered some kind of dark comedy? It feels like a meta film. <laughs> Yeah, that's the question, isn't it, with some of these movies? You have to wonder. I mean, uh, Lindsay's movie Eyeball is the big one. I'm not entirely sure that's meant to be as funny as it is, but it is. Um, yeah. Body Puzzle, yeah, I think they're – one of the things to bear in mind is Lamberto Bava, the son of Mario Bava, who is a director in his own right, has always said he's not very comfortable making Gialli because he's he's never really gotten into the whole, you know, slicing people up thing. He finds it a little distasteful. So I suspect there is an element of dark comedy in that film. Um, I think it's a pretty good movie, uh, by the way. It's got a good central performance from Tomas Arana. Uh, he really makes the movie hang together really well, I think. Um, I rather like that one. The 90s were not a great period for Jallo films, but that was definitely one of the better ones. And Yeah, I, I do think some of that humor is definitely intentional. Uh, okay, Undead Nightmare 24 says, what did you think of the iguana with mm -hmm. the tunnel fire? When I first saw it, I think it was from a Greek VHS, and it looked awful. It just looked awful, and I thought, Freda made this? This is just so shoddy. And I was so excited when it was coming out on Blu-ray. I thought, oh, no. And it still looks awful. <laughs> um, it's, it's a grubby film. It's so weird because, you know, Freda was, was a very good filmmaker when he tried. Um, they, they, it's the only Irish giallo I can think of. It was a lot, you know, some location filming in Dublin, but they didn't choose interesting locations for the most part. It's kind of a grubby, dull looking movie. I kind of like it though, because first of all, it has a fantastic Stelvio Cipriani score. That's a big plus right there. It's got a great score. It's got a really good cast. Anton Differing is wonderful playing the uh, ambassador. Valentina Cortez is wonderful as his wife. Luigi Castilli plays the uh, police inspector who I think Roger Moore was the actor that they really wanted. But um, yeah, I don't know that I would have preferred Roger Moore. I like Luigi Pastilli and Dagmar Lysander is, is in it too. Uh, so it's got a really good cast. It's got a great score. It has the most preposterous climax imaginable. We were talking about ridiculous kills before. You want to see a really tacky ending of that film. Oh my God. Some of it is just genuinely distasteful. Like some nasty, horrible things happen to some really likable characters. And, mm. but then there's, there's this gore stuff that happens. I mean, there's fake slow motion too. Everybody talks about Jess Franco, the, the, the slow motion 
I think it was in uh, Barbed Wire Dolls, the the slow motion sequence where he's chasing after Lena Romay or whatever, and they tussle and he gets shot, and it's all fake slow motion. There's a fake slow motion thing here too, where Luigi Castilli keeps having these flashbacks whenever he was interrogating a suspect who ended up blowing his brains out, and Castilli does the kind of thing in slow motion, fake slow motion, which is hysterical. Yeah. Um, and, and the explanation of the title, <laughs> the, uh, which I can't even get into. My God, it's so politically incorrect. Some of the things that are said in this film, um, I kind of like it. I, I recognize it's not a good movie, but I actually think it's fun to watch. So uh, it would not make the uh, list of the all time great jolly, but it, I, I think it's fun. There you go. Uh, Jay says, um, what are your thoughts on Neo Gialli? I have very complicated feelings about those films because, um, well, there's a variety of reasons. One of them is, for the most part, these films were not made with any real great artistic aspirations. They were exploitation films. They were designed to appeal to a very specific demographic. They were looking to get people into the seats, so they wanted as much salacious elements as possible, sex, nudity, um, violence, gore, you know, action. And, and they, yes, you had people like Argento and Fulci and, and some of the others who were layering in other things into it. But for the most part, these really weren't intellectual movies. And a lot of these kind of neo jally films, I think, kind of miss the point because they get into kind of... It's almost sort of pseudo intellectual masturbation. Uh, and I have the same feeling about some of the things, not to be disrespectful towards anybody who writes about these films, but sometimes there's an attempt to kind of get too deep and heavy and serious and philosophical about some of the things in these films. And I'm just thinking, there's nothing deep about strip nude for your killer. I mean, it, it, there just isn't. This was a grubby exploitation film. Right. Um, that's not to say you can't do it. It just doesn't work for me. It doesn't appeal to me. And I have that same reaction with a lot of the Neo Jolly, uh, a, a lot of that sort of a mare and uh, a lot of those other films. I find them to be completely missing the point, which was these films were very entertaining. They were they were basically meant to be disposable product to a certain extent. It's not to say they weren't done well and they weren't done uh, with a certain degree of polish and skill, but they weren't pretentious. And I think a lot of these films tend to be um, some of them work. I really liked uh, Barbarian Sound Studio. I didn't like it the first time around, but when I saw it again, it really clicked. Um, there are other things like uh, the editor, which I, I I get what they were going for, and I liked some of the jokes. I thought some of it was funny to me, but it was almost it was sort of rambling and incoherent after a certain point. And again, there was kind of a smug attitude that kind of came through. I thought, and, and a lot of the uh, really arty ones, the ones that are just really going for something really deep and profound and, and you know, arty, a lot of them don't really work for me. But hey, it's, you know, it's all a matter of opinion. I know some people were really crazy about things like Amer, but that didn't do anything for me. Well, I, I loved Amer. I, I just, I started, I, I, I'm a filmmaker, so to me, I just love the, I just love how they tried to capture that feeling and that look. I, I, I was a fan of that one. Uh, but I can see how that would uh, not, not uh, be a lot of people's favorite film. Uh, Couch Odyssey says, uh, what's your favorite Giallo poster? Uh, the original Italian poster for Blood and Black Lace, um, which is not the one that you showed. That was the American poster. Mm. The Italian poster is really, really, really beautiful. Um, that would be my my favorite there are so many great ones though i mean some of the ones in particular that were done in the in the 80s 70s and 80s for the argento films for example um but with the crystal plumage for example or the italian poster for deep red are, are really beautiful too um i mean i've got can't see them but in my uh working area here my office um, i've got posters up for things like uh, lizard and a woman's skin uh, as well as italian posters uh, for things like uh, don't torture a duckling and, and so forth. Um, I love the poster artwork for so many of these movies. I mean, it's an art unto itself, but the Italian poster for Blood and Black Lake is definitely my favorite. There you go. Uh, Nico Mendes says, uh, uh, where do you place Martino <laughs> Corso in Giallo? Uh, top 30, top 40. I think it has one of the uh, best third acts ever. 
it's got a fantastic third act and a very so-so first two acts, in my opinion. Um, I've never been as crazy about that one as most people. That movie is very, very popular. I would probably say it's probably the, the most loved Sergio Martino Giallo. And I, I like Martino, but I, I find his work to be kind of anonymous. I, I don't really see like a stylistic or thematic kind of unity with, with Martino. To me, he's just kind of, he's a good journeyman who goes from different genres. And, and I should say the same thing for Lindsay to a certain extent too, although I can see certain thematic and certainly also um, uh, stylistic things that unite his films, at least certain types of films. Um, but Torso, I love the third act. I think the, the third act is fantastic. Prior to that, I really liked the murder sequence in the, uh, it's kind of a swamp. Uh, yeah. You know, with the, with this going. That's really well done too. But a lot of the, the first two thirds of that film, I find to be rather boring, quite frankly. So it's not really one of my great favorites. If I were talking about, Martino, as I said, Mrs. Ward is my favorite. Then after that, probably All the Colors of the Dark, um, Your Vice is a Locked Door or Room, whichever one it is. <laughs> I can't remember. I'll never remember. Um, and uh, Case of the Scorpion's Tale. And then, you know, I, I also like Suspicious Death of a Minor more than most people seem to like. So Torso isn't really one of my great favorites, although that last act definitely is is terrific. Yeah. Phenomenal stuff. Um, and Gizmo says, um, what do you think of The Devil's Honey? I love it, but everyone hates it. What, um, what are your thoughts on that one? I know that's not it's not really a giallo. No, it's not, but that's okay. I don't mind it. I, I don't hate it. I think it's really good. I think it's uh, one of Fulci's best later films. Um, he was very ill by the time he made that film. He had uh, had a, a massive heart attack and then Oh, Lord, there were, there were so many things that went wrong. He had a bad blood transfusion, which ended up giving him hepatitis. And he was just oh, wow. he was in bad, bad shape for the rest of his life. You see him in the film. He has a cameo. He plays a, a street vendor who sells the, um, the young couple a, a bracelet, a sort of charm bracelet. Um, and he looks very gaunt. And he, he's not well. But um, it, it was kind of his attempt at a softcore movie. But it's really interesting because it kind of deals with state of masochism but it deals with it in a very somber and, and rather sad way um so it's it's very kinky i mean you know i i don't i, I imagine it probably helped the sales of saxophones if you've seen the film you know what i mean <laughs> um but and, and maybe also uh, nail polish as well thinking of another scene involving nail polish and a, a stocking run <laughs> that gets the kinky as well um it's it's very uninhibited. I mean, that's I certainly give him credit. He had no no problems about getting in there and, and getting his freak on with that movie, so to speak. But what I really like about it is it's very sort of somber and melancholy, and I think uh, kind of a moving film more so than one might think. Wow. Okay. Uh, I, I've actually I, I just bought it during the seven sale. Everyone said get it, get it, get it. So I've I've I've, I've yet to experience it, but now I'm looking forward to it. I, I am familiar with the saxophone scene. That's one scene that uh, everyone spoke about. I'm like, oh wow, okay. I, I will I will like to look at that. Um, Mike asks. Uh, okay, we're gonna have two more questions, and then we're gonna wrap it up, guys. Uh, Mike asks, uh, do you like the killer reserved at nine seats? Oh yes, I like that one a lot. That's another one um, we were talking before about underrated one. We can toss that one into the pile too. That's the problem when you see so many of these movies. I mean, short of having a list in front of me to jar my memory, it's, it's easy to forget. That's a really interesting one. Um, it anticipates Michele Suave's stage fright in some respects uh, it, with its you know claustrophobic theater setting and, and so mm -hmm. forth. And it has, again, it has kind of a supernatural element going on in it. Uh, really good Carlos Savina soundtrack. and. Uh, not a starry cast, but a good cast uh, of familiar faces from these films from the, the 70s. So, yeah, I like that one a lot, definitely. Nice. Okay, uh, last question uh, from R. Hilton Fine Art. Uh, I'm a big Poopy Avati fan. Can you ask someone in power to release the Arcane Enchanter in the U.S.? <laughs> I've tried. Believe me, I've tried. I've been after... I won't say who I've said to various different labels though, that I've worked for, you know, you should look into Avati. Um, I've, I've certainly mentioned house of the laughing windows. I've mentioned the arcane enchanter. I've mentioned uh, several other films of his and uh, 
Heart of the problem I'm given to understand, and I don't want to get too much into it because I don't know how much of this is to be repeated publicly, but I understand that some of it may be down to the Avanti brothers themselves, that um, they may be a little difficult in terms of the amount of money that they want for these things. This is why some of these films aren't out. It's not because the labels don't care. It's because sometimes the rights holders have really unrealistic ideas about what these movies are worth um, mm. to restore the films, put together extras and put out a package costs money. And if, if the rights holders want too much, then sometimes it's just not going to happen. So I think that might have something to do with it as well. Uh, but there may be other aspects as well that I'm not privy to, but I'll continue to ask because I'd like to have all of those films released as well. There you go. So don't worry guys, Troy has your back and uh, we'll look forward to many more uh, commentary tracks and, and your books and, all that good stuff. Thank you so much for being here, Tori. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, if you're ever desperate enough to have me back, I'll, I'll be only too happy to accommodate. Uh, <laughs> I had a good time. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely uh, be bringing you back. Um, uh, everybody watching at home, uh, just so you know, this is my last live show uh, before I go on my break. I am reaching one year daily videos here on YouTube on Monday, July 5th. I've got all my videos planned up until then. July 5th comes. I'm going to be releasing a big video where I'm announcing a couple things, so stay tuned for that. Uh, and then I go on vacation for 10 days. Uh, I will not be on YouTube. I will not look at, at movie news. Well, I probably will look at movie news, but I won't post about it or anything. I just want to take a real big reset, uh, and then I'll come back um, next. Well, look at the calendar right now just to double check. So I want to make sure I got the dates correctly. I will come back on the 16th, July 16th, and I'll be joined by Troy's pal, Nathaniel Thompson. And uh, we haven't decided on what we're talking about. Uh, we have to sort of figure it out. Um, well, I, you know, we covered Gialli, so I think uh, Nathaniel and I are going to pick something else to, uh, to, to, to ramble and, and, and get real geeky about. So stay tuned for that. But, uh, yeah, this is the last live for a while. And I thank you so much for joining me, uh, everybody at home. And Troy. You're a brother from another mother, man. Thank you so much. Thank you, and ciao. Uh, everybody at home, I love you very much. Take care of yourselves. I, I appreciate you hanging in with us. Uh, we will see you when we see you. Uh, I will uh, have a video tomorrow and, and Sunday and Monday, and then, and then it's vacation time. Uh, but for now, we bid you adieu. Remember, take care of yourselves. You're important. You're special. You matter to this world, not just to me but to the world in general. Take care of yourself. We'll talk soon. We remain to be continued.